Backwards pass now throwing it into the end zone. And that pass is caught by the Falcons. First no matchup, but they're going to give it to Slaughter and see what he can get. He fumbles the football. press box here at Elliott Field. And really last season was a disappointment for Fitchburg State. There's no other way to put it. They were three and seven last year, losing their last five games in a row. The last two of those by a combined score of 62 to seven. That's not what you want. And that typically leads to a little bit of change. And that's what we see for Fitchburg State this year. There's a new head coach, Jim McGuire. There's a new starting quarterback as well, Brandon Brown, the freshman. And as the Falcons take the field, we're gonna send it down to our sideline correspondent, Amanda Agassi, who has a spotlight on some returning players for the Falcons. Good afternoon, everyone. And we are so excited to be back. As you can see, the Falcons just ran out. Football is back. We are so hype out here. It's a beautiful day for football. Bright blue skies, 76 degrees. Let's get right into it. Now, John and Dan mentioned that Fitchburg is facing a lot of new changes this season from the coaching staff to the players. But with that comes your veterans returning. And I'm joined by Tony um, Brown and Pamela Crawford, the returning players of Jesse Brown and Malik Crawford. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited. So now we just talk about little minor injuries for both of your sons, but they are dressed to play. And you know, that's what veteran players do. They that's get out right. there and able to put their team on their back. So speaking of that, how do you think the, the team will do this season? I think they're going to do amazing. Even though Jesse was hurt, he is so confident that he's ready and he's going to do amazing things. And I say the same thing for Malik. He'll, he, he's ready. He's ready to play. Watch out for him. Hey, Thank you. that's what I like to hear. Now, you guys have been part of the Falcon family for three years now. Time is flying by. How has that been for you? It's been amazing. I can't believe that my son is already a junior. It seemed like he just started, like, recently. So I'm so glad it's moving on. Football is great. He's doing great. And I'm just waiting to see what happens next. Yes, this is going to be an amazing season this year. Watch. Watch, um, Falcons. We're going to win this year. I like it. I like it. And now last question I asked my boys, the boys on media day, a celebratory dance. Let's see it. You guys have a celebratory dance. Ooh, with the dab. Let's do it all together. <laughs> One, two, three, and dab. Okay. Yes, we are ready. We are hype. Let's go Falcon football. Back to you guys up top. Thank you so much for that, Amanda. And I want to state for the record, I will not dab on television. That's not happening. It's not happening. One man who might dab on television is my good friend Danny Bolak. And Dan, let's take a look at the opposition real quick for Fitchburg State. It's a very tough challenge early on as they take on the uh, Red Dragons of SUNY Cortland. Absolutely. SUNY Cortland, last year 7-4, and 5-2 and two in the Empire 8 Conference, winners of the New York Bowl. They're going to be quite the week one challenge here for Fitchburg State today. And we'll step aside for the national anthem and be back with more analysis in just a moment. It's Fitchburg State University football right here on FATV.
Fitchburg State University football is live here on FATV, and if you folks at home know anyone, maybe from New York or maybe from anywhere around the world who would like to watch this game live, a reminder that you can do just that at FATV.org. Now, once again, Dan Bolek, we take a look at the Red Dragons of SUNY Cortland, winners of the New York Bowl last year. And again, a very, very stiff test on the first game of this season for the Falcons. Absolutely, and Cortland bringing back a lot of great weapons. <laughs> Johnny Aiken, Zach Tripodi, both strong running backs in the backfield. They bring back their two best receivers in Nick Anderson and Alex Wasserman. One player they don't bring back, Steven Ferreira, one of the best passers in SUNY Cortland history. He graduates. But last year, threw for over 2,500 yards and 24 touchdowns. Brett Zagala will try to fill the hole left by Ferreira. And you saw real quick Jim McGuire there, the Springfield College alumnus, in his first season as head coach of the Falcons, although by no means his first season with Fitchburg State. He's been with the Falcons in some capacity on and off since 1999, finally getting a chance to be the head man here. So Fitchburg State will receive the opening kickoff and we'll get a chance to look at the revamped Falcon offense. Noah Wiseman's kick is short, high end over end, taken in on the far sideline at about the 33 yard line. And really no return at all to speak of. Looks like that was Marquise Calton on the return for the Falcons, senior from Springfield, Massachusetts. And Dan, as the Falcon offense takes the field for the first time, there are a lot of new faces, the most prominent of which will be under center. Number eight, Brandon Brown is the quarterback. Absolutely, Brandon Brown, a freshman from Lake Mary, Florida. Had a completion percentage of about 54% during his senior year at Lake Mary. Threw for 16 touchdowns, ran for six more. At about seven yards a carry as well. He is a very mobile quarterback. Falcons go shotgun, three wide receivers. Sterling Garvin is the man in the backfield, and he'll take the pitch on first down. Not much there, breaks a tackle, but he will still be dragged down in the backfield. There were a number of Dragons there on the hit. Looks like Denari Beard was one of the initial tacklers. And it's a loss of maybe about half a yard, call it no gain on the first play for the new look Falcons. Sterling Garvin picking up the new number one from Javon Brown Simpson who graduated. That number one marking the lead running back and on his first run of the season, just trying to run and find some space on the right side, but just not a lot going there. Cortland playing stout on their very first try. Falcons go with two men in the backfield here on second down. Jaquay Solomon will actually get the carry straight up the middle. A decent game, maybe three or four yards. Looks like the Falcons may have been running an option play there. Three yards on that play. Just a run up the middle for Jaquay Solomon. We expect Garvin and Solomon to be the two lead backs in the backfield. We'll Although maybe not, as, to, as Jaquay Solomon is limping off the field, favoring his left leg. He's already taken his helmet off and he's gonna be attended to. So two plays, two yards, and one injury for the Falcons. They face third down and a long seven. Trips receivers to the far side left. Brown goes from the shotgun with Garvin to his right. Takes the snap, looks left, throws left, passes high and incomplete. Looks like it was intended for Jesse Brown, one of the returning receivers for the Falcons. That's one of the interesting challenges for the Falcons is they've lost a lot of their receiver core from last year and with Herbert Acosta injured, Jesse Brown is actually the only player on the Falcon roster who has experience hauling in passes at the collegiate level. He's the only, He's one, the only one who's made a single catch. So the Falcons go three and out. Low snap, punt is away. It's a very good kick, high spiraling. Goes out of bounds at about the 20 yard line. A very good kick there by new punter Bryce Santos. Santos, a junior from Pelham, New Hampshire, went to school at Worcester Academy and he is a transfer from Merrimack College. Split, he split punting duties last year with the Warriors and he's going to try to help improve the Falcons kick and punt game. In fact, the kicker, punter, and kickoff specialist that the Falcons had last year, none of them returned. So Santos is going to be called on to do a lot for the green and gold this year. It really is a new look Fitchburg State attack on every side of the ball. Now SUNY Cortland takes over, first and 10 at their own 19 yard line. Handoff goes to the right side, that's Johnny Akins, the ball carrier. He gets a couple. 
It's actually a pretty good run. Call it five yards, and it'll be second down and five. Aiken Sr. running back 5'9", 200 from Roosevelt to New York. He was the leader running back for the Red Dragons last year. And as a senior, looks to continue in that role this year. Now takes the swing pass after going in motion from the backfield, but that is well defended by the Falcons. Good job there by Javon White, senior corner from Meriden, Connecticut. Driving Aikens out of bounds after what looks like a gain of about a yard. One of the positive things for the Falcons last year, they had the best pass defense in the MassCat, giving up just 168 yards through the air per game. So now it'll be third down and a long three. Red Dragon offense led by quarterback Brad Sigala. He's got Aikens to his right. And he will hand it off to Aikens straight up the middle. He is going to be short of the line to gain. So the Falcon defense stands tall, and the Red Dragons will elect to send out the punt team rather than go for it on fourth and one deep in their own territory. Great first drive for the Falcon defense. Looks like Liam Casey in to kick it away for the Red Dragons. Set back deep to return for Fitchburg State is Kevin Quinn. Quinn, one of many new faces on this Falcon squad, a freshman from Holliston, Mass, 5'9", 145. Casey's punt spirals and then takes a good Red Dragon punt. Bounce. That's going to come to rest inside the 20-yard line. So it's a battle for field position in the early going of this one. Fitchburg State will take over first and 10 right on their own 20-yard line. So, Dan, I know it was only three plays and there was just the one pass. What did you see from the Falcons on offense that they need to improve going forward? Well, I'd like to see a little more of the passing game thus far. They went with the run, run, pass. Don't want to make it look too much like Marty Ball, you know. <laughs> Marty Schottenheimer, if for those who may remember. Marty Schottenheimer will be a punchline long after any of us are dead, unfortunately. He was a good coach. He just played for Falcons have two men in the backfield on first down. Low snap, Brown handles, under pressure, rolls to his left, looking to create something he cannot. He is brought down in the backfield. Looks like that's Devin Smith with the sack for the Red Dragons. It's a loss of about four. One positive was Jaquay Salmon was back on the field for the Falcons on that play with the two running backs. Unfortunately, Brown Ran to his right, ran to his left, just couldn't find an opening and was wrapped up for a loss. So now second down and 14 for the Falcons. They need to get out to their own 30-yard line. Two men in the backfield once again. Looks like it's Garvin alongside Juandre House. Garvin will run behind the house. Gets a couple of yards, might have gotten back to the initial line of scrimmage. They're going to mark him down at the 20, call it third down and 10 now. It was actually Kenny Richards who made that run, who was playing the role of the fullback there, trying to do some blocking, the junior from Lawrence. Oh, okay. Now you see Richards and Garvin head to the sideline on what will be a long third down attempt for the Falcon offense. Fitchburg State still yet to complete a pass thus far. It is early, less than five minutes gone in the first quarter. Brown from the shotgun, rolling to his right, under pressure, looking to get rid of it. Now he'll keep it himself, try to get something. Ducks out of bounds after a gain of a couple, but well short of the first down marker. And Fitchburg State goes three and out for the second possession in a row. The intention the whole time, just to try to find a receiver downfield, but there was no one to be found, so Brown did what he could, try to get the first down as best he could. He got about four or five yards on that run, but you'll but if you're court, when you'll gladly give up four or five. Bryce Santos back in to kick it away. Santos with another good kick. Drifts inside the 40 yard line. Return made this time by Brandon Lewis for the Red Dragons. He gets it into Falcon territory. So uh, SUNY Cortland will have pretty good field position as they start their second possession. Uh, 
Looks like the officials are talking to the Falcon sideline here. It was actually, they're discussing like things with the timekeepers. Looks like we've gotten it all straightened out. Portland's second possession of the game. First and 10 Red Dragons at the Falcon 47 yard line. Sagala from the shotgun rolls to his left. He's got a bit of an opening in front of him. If he can turn the corner, he barely can before he's dragged down from behind. Tyreek Watford basically grabbed his waistband and pulled him down, limiting, limiting him to a gain of about three yards. Great pressure by the Falcons defense to force Sagala to scramble on first down. And held him to just a few yards. Sagala last year only ran the ball three times. In fact, he only played one game last year for the Red Dragons. Handoff on second down goes to Johnny Akins. He's across the 40, mark him down actually right at the 40 yard line. Good gain of about five yards. It'll bring up third down and three for the State University of New York at Portland. Suni goes four wide, trips to the right. Now motion to the near side comes Jaden Kyler. Shotgun snap, looking long to the left. He's got a step pass, he's hauled in, and he will walk in. Touchdown Red Dragons, Jake Smith with the 37 yard catch and run. Smith was injured all last year in his first game back with the Red Dragons hauling in a touchdown catch. The senior wideout from Albany putting the first points on the board today. Smith, one of the captains for the Red Dragons of SUNY Cortland. It's his first catch of the year and it is a big one. Six points on the board and they'll look to make it seven. Nick Mongelli on to attempt the extra point. It is up and good. So with 8.25 to go here in the first quarter of play, SUNY Cortland draws first blood. They lead it by a score of 7-0. Of course, on the very first play of the game, if you will, that had a major impact, of course, it was Cortland going all the way for six. So now, Dan, the Falcon offense, they go three and out on their first two possessions and now find themselves in a hole, what do they have to do? What what do, what have you seen from the Falcons that they haven't been able to put together yet? Got to put a little more work into making Brandon Brown a little more comfortable in the pocket because he's been running left and right. He hasn't really had the chance to square up and really get a good pass off. No, it, it feels like you're right. He hasn't had that time in the pocket. It feels like within a second of taking the snap. He's under pressure, he's rolling out. And it feels like he's tucking the ball a little quickly, maybe? But no, it's two possessions. And I know it's gonna take a little while It's like to watch not just this game against Cortland, but next week's game against Castleton before we really have an idea what to expect out of this Falcon team this year. And after all, these two games, they are non-conference. Noah Wyman, another very short kickoff for Cortland. This one's just hauled in a leaping catch made by Mike August, one of the uh, initial blockers for the Falcons. Is that actually 94? That's 94, Samuel Kenny, freshman D lineman. The Falcons brought in a lot of freshmen this year, 35 freshmen, plus a few other transfers from community colleges as well. At least half the roster is new. And you know, we mentioned that, but that extends everywhere. There's a new quarterback. You know, Sterling Garvin has been around, but this is his first time as the lead rushing back. New receiving core pretty much all over the place. Falcon offense now first and 10 at their own 41. Garvin, the ball carrier, takes it up along the left side. Nothing doing there. Red Dragon D-line just swarming all over him. It's a gain of maybe a yard. Also interesting how the Falcons have been setting up by loading all of their receiving options on one side of the field, leaving the other side empty. And on that first down play, they ran Garvin to the left side, to the empty side, hoping that Kenny Richards would be able to make some blocking room happen. And a yard was all they were able to get out of it. This time a little more balanced. 
Two receivers to the near side, one to the far. We have a tight end lined up on the near side as well. Handoff goes up the middle. This is Jaquay Solomon, the ball carrier. Solomon gets to about the 45-yard line. It's a gain of three yards right there. So trying to go back and forth between Sterling Garvin and Jaquay Solomon. But for both of them, they've averaged about three yards a carry throughout their Falcon career. And three yards was what they got on that one as well. And now once again, Fitchburg State faces third and long, this time third down and six from their own 45-yard line. Portland fans on the near sideline are making the rafters shake. Brown under pressure, immediately throws to the right, passes high, but it is brought down. Catch is made, he's gonna be short of the line to gain. That was Kevin Quinn with the catch. Looks like he's brought down at the Falcon 49-yard line. It's fourth and two at midfield and your heavy underdogs. Why are you punting? Because it's the first quarter. But it's fourth and two at midfield and your heavy underdogs. But it's the first quarter. And but it's fourth and two at midfield. We could have this argument all day. Yep. We, we could have this argument all day. We, we could, we could. Santos's kick is away, high end over end. Taken in at about the 20 yard line by Brandon Lewis. He's across the 25, 30, and shoved out of bounds at about the 35 yard line after a decent return. It was fourth and two at midfield and you punted for a net gain of 15 yards. And so it goes. We'll see how Cortland comes out here on their third drive of the day. 6.30 to go in the first quarter. And there once again you see Jim McGuire, new head coach for the Falcons. After, again, several seasons as the special teams coordinator, offensive coordinator. First down pass to the right side is underthrown. Penalty flag comes in late, however. Basically looked like they wanted to run the exact same pattern as they did for the touchdown. Just a little move and then a go pattern for Jake Smith up along the near sideline. DeMonte Hart was back for the Falcons. And it looked like he was playing some solid defense there, but maybe grabbing a little too much. And that is the call. Pass interference on DeMonte Hart, the freshman DB from Fort Myers, Florida. So that will put the ball at the 50-yard line, as in college football, pass interference is capped at 15 yards. So the Red Dragons now first and 10, pretty much right at midfield. Handoff goes to Aikens running to the right side, and he gets nothing. He is dragged down immediately. Caleb Gonsalves leading the hit for the Falcon defensive line that time. There was the flock of Falcons. Making the nice stop there, preventing Aikens from really getting anything productive. Second down and nine now for the Red Dragons. Aikens the ball carrier again, looking for space to the right side. This time he has it. Johnny Aikens has a first down. Stop the clock and move the chains with 5.46 to go here in the first quarter. Well, on the last play, the Falcons had so many players up the middle, they were going to stop that run up the middle regardless, and they went with more or less the same defense the second time. That time, Aikens sniffed it out, ran to the flank on the right side where there weren't as many players. First down handoff, Johnny Aikens. This time, he just has an enormous hold of the right side. I don't think he was touched until seven yards downfield. He has himself another first down. Again, going to the right side flank, and there is room there. He did not He's get actually first down. spotted just shy of the line to gain. It'll be second down and one. But all of a sudden, Dan, the Red Dragons, after going three and out on their first possession, they seem nigh unstoppable. This time the handoff goes to Zach Trippity, and he lives up to his name, falling down in the backfield for a loss of about a yard. An unexpected top, an unexpectedly blown tire from Zach Trippity. And he might have had a shot at a first down there, but ends up being minus one yard on his first rushing attempt of the day. 
to stay with Chipotle in the backfield on third down. Falcon defense got a bit of a break there, see if they can capitalize. This time the quarterback keeper. Sagala carries it himself. Fitchburg State was completely unprepared for that. It'll be a first down and more. I think that's gonna set up first and goal for the Red Dragons. No, they're actually gonna spot him at about the 12, 13 yard. And on that play, Sagala taking the ball immediately with boatloads of confidence. That was, a, that was definitely a designed quarterback run from the offset, and it was very well executed by the Red Dragons of SUNY Cortland. Now first and 10 for them at the 13-yard line. Throws to the right side, pass is caught. Are they gonna give him the touchdown there or mark him out of bounds? They gave him the touchdown. Touchdown, Red Dragons. Looks like that's Jason Carlock. Sophomore receiver from Babylon, New York, making his first catch and touchdown of the young season. Second career touchdown for Carlock at 11 receptions last year. He was able to just reach around the Falcon defender for six. Nick Mangelli's extra point attempt on coming. Good snap, good hold, good kick. Not a good first quarter for the new look Fitchburg Falcons as SUNY Cortland leads by a total of 14-0 with 4.15 to go here in the first period. Well, I know one of the challenges for the Falcons coming into today is the fact that SUNY Cortland, they're coming out of the Empire 8 Conference, always a powerful conference. In fact, last year, their champion was Brockport. Brockport made it to the national semifinals. In fact, Fitchburg's conference rival Plymouth won the MassCAC last year. They played Brockport in the first round. And that contest featured 66 points scored. Brockport got them all. I was going to ask how, how many of those were Brockport. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. That's, that's not good. If, and that's the type of team that you expect out of the Empire 8. Portland played them last year and lost 52 to 38. Brockport's one loss was in the national semifinal to the national finalist Mary Harden Baylor, who would go on to lose to Mount Union in the championship game. And that's. And that's your wrap-up of the Empire 8 in a nutshell. <laughs> Another short kickoff, end over end. Taken in at about the 33-yard line and brought down after a gain of just a couple yards. Now, ordinarily, Dan, when a team falls behind early in the first quarter, we tend to look at the history and say, well, you know, back in 1983, these two teams met and there was a 14-point deficit. And we, we can't exactly do that between the Raiders, or between the Red Dragons of Sudan Cortland and the Falcons of Fitchburg State, can we? We cannot, as this is the first time they've ever met. Can we talk about how maybe in women's basketball there was a big deficit and they, they came back? Well, we don't know if that, well, that story's never happened, as far as we know. They've never played SUNY Cortland in anything, have they? They've never played SUNY Cortland in anything. Dang it. First and 10 Falcons from their own 38-yard line. Play action fake, rolling to the right is Brown. That pass is caught. They're gonna say it's a catch and he's down. The Dragons are incensed. I would not recommend that. They might breathe fire on you, but uh, I think they're going to mark it a catch and then he's down, or maybe the officials are conferring. The thing to point out, too, is that it's only going to be a catch of about a yard and a half to two yards if they were to give it. And it looks like they are. But of course, every yard. Every, every yard, yard counts. Every yard counts, every yard matters, but. I would rather have second and seven than second and ten were I rooting for the Falcons in this game. I'm just saying. Absolutely. So it is second down and seven for Fitchburg State. Ball spotted at their own 41-yard line. Handoff goes up the middle to Garvin. And he is brought down pretty much at the line. And once again, Dan, and maybe I'm just reading too much into this. You got a new quarterback. You got a mobile guy there under center. It looked like that might have been an option. Am I completely just making that up in my head, or did that look like it might have been the case? I think it might have had the option there as Brown was throwing it right into the, but I guess Brown threw it right into the breadbasket of Garvin. Garvin went straight up the middle and was taken down by five and 55 of SUNY Cortland, Max Jean, and Kyle Richard. So now third down, call it a long six maybe for the Falcons. 
They need to get to their own 48. Quick pass to the right side is in and out of the hands of the intended receiver, Jesse Brown. Even if he had made the catch, he was going to be brought down immediately short of the line to gain. Falcon offense, I believe, has not yet achieved a first down as they go three and out again. And that's the second time we've seen a pass look catchable for Jesse Brown, but was unable to come up with it either fault one way or the other. But regardless, the Falcons really struggling to make progress against this Red Dragon defense. Bryce Santos's punt is away. High wobbling thing taken in at about the 15 yard line. Nothing really developing and finally brought down is Brandon Lewis. And I will say, Dan, it's not entirely for lack of better options. Bryce Santos has been the best offensive weapon the Falcons have today. Absolutely. One of the strong tenets of the Falcons defense, Bryce Santos, the transfer, former Division II punter. He's been able to put some distance on these kicks. That's really going to help Fitchburg. Red Dragons pinned back fairly deep in their own territory. First and 10 at the 20. And you see Brett Sagala, the quarterback. He's got Johnny Aikens to his left. And it will be a handoff to Aikens coming back across the formation. He's got a pretty good gain there. Call it about six, seven yards. They'll mark him at the 28 yard line. And of course there's Aikens again. With some productive running. Aikens now over 40 yards through the ground on the day. And that's just here in the first quarter. Second down and three for SUNY Portland. Aikens the ball carrier again. He's hit after a gain of a few, but it is gonna be enough for a Red Dragon first down. Mark him at the 32 yard line, four more yards gained by Aikens. Red Dragons moving the chains yet again. Red Dragons going from that shotgun formation. Hand off to Aikens on the run to the far right side. He is dragged down from the side this time. Really not much of a gain there at all. That's David Morales, the junior defensive end, making the stop for Fitchburg State. Morales basically able to grab Aikens by the jersey and pull him down by that, and he was able to get his hand just not too high. He almost got the nameplate there, and that would have been a horse collar if they'd ruled he had gotten the nameplate, but it looked like he got him just below it. Second down and nine now for the Red Dragons. Three receivers, as you can see, to the near side. Sagala looks left, throws over the middle. Pass is caught, breaking out of one tackle into the open field. He's got the speed, and he is gone. Touchdown, Red Dragons. That is Alex Wasserman with the big gainer, and this is quickly becoming a laugher. Alex Wasserman, his sixth career touchdown catch. And Javon White looked like he had the coverage there, nearly had him wrapped up, but Wasserman able to squeak out of it and run it all the way down the field. 67 yards for the third SUNY Cortland touchdown in as many possessions. And they will attempt the extra point to make it 21. A little bit of motion there before the snap. I think they're gonna, they're gonna get the Falcons for encroachment. Declined. Cortland is fine just setting up where they are. Not a terribly large amount of difference between a 20 yard extra point and 18 and a half yard extra point. And Nick Mongelli's kick is true. So, Dan, this has not gone well. No, it has not. It has been a challenge for the Falcons. I think when they put SUNY Cortland on the schedule, they knew it was going to be a challenge, especially since a team strong enough that Framingham State, the defending, well, the pick to win the MassCAC championship, defending co-champion of the MassCAC, although they did not get the automatic bid, 
as they ended up losing the tiebreak with Plymouth. So Framingham's played them historically year in, year out, and they've struggled in years, although they did beat SUNY Cortland last year. They'll be playing again next week. That'll be Cortland's next game. They'll be hosting Framingham State. They're getting their fill of the Mascac early. The one thing to watch, and we've seen it four times already now, is these kickoffs for SUNY Cortland. It's been Noah Weinman doing the kicking, and they are all very short kicks. Falcons have to be prepared for that. This one's a little longer than most, by which I mean it's going to bounce at the 25-yard line and be picked up there. Trying to make something on the return. It's Marvin Lovett the third. And now we get a little frustration boiling over. It took a bit of a shot there. Falcons not happy with the way that the Cortland tackler went into Lovett there. So the Falcons will send their offense back out once again. First and 10 at their 25 yard line. And at this point against a very tough Cortland defense, they are in pursuit of a first down over four today on third down. And that's the kind of mentality right there that you need to be a football coach. Dan McNeil is up 21 points, not even out of the first quarter, and he's still barking at the referees. Is that good? Eh, is it going to make him successful? Yeah, bro. First and 10 handoff for the Falcons goes to the left side. Not much doing there, maybe a yard. Falcons trying to switch it up a little bit. Chris Tomichetti with the run on that one. Tom McKetty switching his number from 28 to 11 for his senior season. He's from Lowell, graduate of Lowell Catholic. Falcons might get one more playoff before the end of the first period here. You can see on your screen the difference between the game clock and the play clock, and they're under no obligation to get it off if they don't want it. I think they're going to slowly meander their way back upfield, switch ends, and see if you know, maybe the left end zone is just cursed. Dan, is it possible that in the, we haven't been here in a few months, is it possible, conceivable, that in the off season, a witch doctor put a hex on the left end zone here at Elliott Field? It could be possible, but in the off chance though that they have in some way, then hopefully that will be the good end zone for the Falcons in the second. That would be the Falcons will score 21 unanswered points here in the second quarter, right? That's how that works. Could always be like that, you never sure. know. I don't know if that's actually good strategy, but you know, it could be a rogue witch doctor. Maybe it's not like a professional witch doctor that they hired to put in, it's just some guy. Could be. Okay. So, I would also talk about how the uh, coaches' polls went. And that's a bit of a challenge for the Falcons, too, as they were actually chosen by the coaches this year to win the wooden spoon, which unfortunately means to come last. Yeah, that's, it's not so much win as just be, be handed if it would It's ninth out of nine. As for Cortland, the Empire 8 didn't bother to put out a coach's poll, from what I could find. Okay. So we don't really know how good they're expected to be. It doesn't seem like that's a thing the Empire 8 does. I mean, the conference is just so good. Just assume everybody's going to be good. Well, uh, SUNY Cortland is good. But uh, let's see just how good as we move into the second period of action. And with the play-by-play -play call for that, here is Mr. Danny Bolek. Thank you very much, John. Not the greatest welcome to college football Saturday here for the Falcons. 20, down 21 to nothing as we start this quarter. And that pass is rejected. Getting his hands up in the air is Tanner Olson, just storming through and sending that down like a volleyball spike. Did you just channel John Boyce and the announcer from NBA Jam in the same sentence? I found a way. I love you. You're my favorite broadcast partner. No offense to Todd Robbins and Alex Bogdasarian and everyone else I've called Game Truth, but you're the best. Thank you very much, John. But nonetheless, an incomplete pass. And for Brown, now two for five through the air in this contest as it goes to third down and nine to go. Tom McKetty still in the backfield, three receivers to his right. Brown takes the snap, rolls to his right, looking around under pressure, and he gets a pass off. He's just trying to throw that one away as he could feel Dan Appley coming from behind, and Brown didn't want anything to do with that, just threw the ball away, couldn't find a receiver, and once again, three and out.
I mean, it's very easy to sit here in the press box and you know be an observer and say the Falcons need to mix things up on offense. I understand first season head coach, freshman quarterback, brand new players up and down the line. The Falcons really need to mix it up on offense a little in my opinion. In the meanwhile, it is a bit of a challenge. Fair catch by Brandon Lewis at his own 40 yard line and that is where the Red Dragons will start looking for yet another successful drive. They've scored on, I believe, now three in a row. It has been three consecutive possessions with touchdowns for SUNY Cortland. Cortland. They went three and out on their first drive, and since then it's been touchdown, touchdown, and touchdown. Absolutely. Not the greatest start of the season for the Falcons, but they knew coming in this was going to be a tough battle. And Cortland has been bringing the fire. hear the Cortland coaches yelling, we need a receiver out there. And so running out on the field now is Nick Anderson getting in position. They've got both their running backs in the backfield. It's an end around on first down and ro rolling to his right and taking a shot up high before going to the ground is Cole Burgess, I believe. It was Kiambu Jones who finally made the tackle. Javon White made the first big hit and then Jones drove him down with the second. Ultimately, all the discombobulation for Cortland means an unsuccessful play. They lose two yards on, on first down and now second and 12. Akins and Tripodi in the backfield. Akins will take it this time, will go up the middle, just trying to follow the pile. And he's able to get back to the original line of scrimmage. Plus about a yard, but it will bring up third down and nine. And Dan, getting back to that end around call on first down, you might wonder why Cortland would choose to do that given that the more basic offense they've been running has worked so well. But I think that's a really good call. I mean, it's the first game of the season, you've got a big lead. Why not try it and see if it works? But try some things as Sagala throws downfield, looking for the home run pass and incomplete to Nick Anderson. Dove out there and just couldn't haul it in. Anderson had a step on his receiver and nothing but green grass in front of him. Unfortunately, the pass was just a bit outside his reach. I think he might have left a divot at about the 37 yard line. And for Cortland, you're up by three scores. Why not try some non-traditional plays? Try some of the plays in the back of your playbook that you haven't been thinking too much about. Try some different things because... Especially given it's the first game of the season. If this is actually going to be a good weapon for you, it's worth a shot. The only downside is it's on the scouting film. Punt nearly blocked, called for a fair catch and taken in by the Falcons of Kevin Quinn. So the Falcon defense forces a, four, a three and out for the first time since the first possession of the game. I'm telling you, the left end zone is cursed. You can't prove it's not. Let's see, while I have a moment, how about we talk about, you know, how far away are these teams? Oh, I know I read it, which is why you're setting it up, but I'm going to say 255 miles. Is that right? I measured it as 225 as the crow flies about. Okay. A little over a five-hour drive. On first down, Brown looking to pitch it out. Now we'll go to his right. He's going to jump throw downfield incomplete. He was looking for Jesse Brown, trying to hit the Brown to Brown connection, but he overthrew it there the first real deception we've seen from the Falcon offense. I think they ran one, plat, one pass out of play action, but this time they fake the pitch to the left side, roll the quarterback right, and throw long to the right. It's a well-designed play, just wasn't exactly as well executed as you'd like. We'll bring up second and 10 and go back to that previous point too. About five hour drive. This is actually the only time this year that Cortland is scheduled to play a game outside the state of New York. Well, New York is big, they have plenty of schools. Plenty of stuff for them to accomplish out there. And this time, here's a nice run by Sterling Garvin. Out on the left side, down at the 45 yard line. And there is the first first down for the Falcons today. Took 17 minutes and they got one. Nothing fancy there, just a run up the gut, really good blocking. 
think Cortland was expecting a pass. They didn't have that many defenders in the box. Falcons go against their expectations, run it up the middle, manage to get 15 yards and a first down. A good run for Sterling Garvin. Now the Falcons with their first first down of the game. Two receivers to the near side on first down. He will give it to Garvin this time. And not a terrible run. A yard short of midfield, a three yard gain. I will say, Dan, you mentioned the, the five hour drive, 225 miles. The near stands here at Elliott Field are filled with, uh, with visitors from SUNY Cortland. Do you know what I'm just noticing, Dan? Yes. The Falcons are on the near sideline. Weren't they on the far sideline last year? Wasn't that a thing? That was a thing, but then again, in years before, they were always on the near sideline, so apparently they've changed it back to the way it was before. This is true. I remember last year the rationale was the crowd here on the near sideline is always so loud it's a little difficult for coaches to communicate with players. Apparently they don't think that's an issue. Or just not worked out so well. I remember a few years ago the Falcons traditionally shot at one end of the recreation center, but the men's basketball team changed ends because they felt that that hoop was better. That year they went 2-22. and 22. I see. And so they switched it back the following year. Mm -hmm. Well, they did go 3-7 and seven last year, so. Try another change. Here's another third down for the Falcons. As Brown steps back, looking, throws near side. That is caught by Solomon, and he's going to get the first down. That's a great individual effort by Jaquay Solomon. After he made that catch, there was a man bearing down on him who would have brought him down about two yards shy of the line to gain, but Solomon kept his head, faked to his left, got the defender to go in that direction, and then changed direction, went right, picked up the extra yardage he need, got another first down. And that's the first third down conversion for the Falcons today as well. So they moved the change yet again, and the Falcons trying to get in business here. Get the split backfield on first and 10 from the Cortland 42 as Brown will throw across his body and it's going to be caught by Sterling Garvin. Another first down for the Falcons. And I told you we needed to see it and we are in fact seeing it. The Falcons are mixing it up a little bit more, going with a little more deceptive actions. This time they move the quarterback right, they take a running back with them to the right. They have the entire offensive line pull to the right side, and then stop, pull up, throw to your left side, you got a man wide open. It was a well-designed and well-executed play by the Falcon offense. Interesting that the running backs are the ones making the catches there in Garvin and Solomon. Another first down for the Falcons, this time a run. Garvin protects the ball, running forward. He's gonna get some yards on this one, and will get it into the Red Dragon red zone. Tanner Olson thought for a moment he was going to bring Garvin down in the backfield, but that time Garvin hit the circle button, did a nice little spin move on him, left him eating nothing but dirt, and picked up a good game. So we take under 10 minutes to go in this first half, 21 nothing Red Dragons. I haven't played Madden in about five years. Is circle still the spin move button? I actually haven't played Madden in about that long as well. Dang it. No. Oh. So second down at about four. Brown waiting for the snap, two receivers to the right. He's looking over to the right, up the middle, and that one is incomplete as he was looking for Drew Ridnour. Looking for the tight end there, the sophomore from Mashpee. Looks like Ridnour had a step on the linebacker covering him. Unfortunately, the pass from Brown was a little high and a little behind him. Couldn't make the adjustment in time. The timing between Ridnour and Brown just not quite on the same page. Now third down and four to go. Let's see if the Falcons can get the first here and keep the drive going. They'll be curious, and if they can't, they'll be curious to see what they do on fourth down. Split backfield again for the Falcons. Again, Solomon and Garvin. It'll be a pitch out to Garvin. He's looking for the right flank. I don't think he's gonna get there. He's gonna lose a lot of yards. Third down at the 19 yard line. It's gonna set up a fourth down at about the 24. Looks like the Falcons are sending on the field goal unit. That'll be curious to see. Jeffrey Reichert not returning, so it would be Bryce Santos, we would expect. And he is out there. 
Connor Fitzsimons set to be the holder. Looks like it's going to be about a 41-yard field goal. I can tell you this, it's been a long time since a Falcon has kicked a field goal that long. So we'll see, right to left kick for Bryce Santos, 41 yards. Snap is down, kick is blocked. Didn't get a lot on that one. It looked like Cortland was able to get their way up. Falcons pick it up, but they can't recover it that way. And there is also a flag on the play. It's a flag down right at about the spot of the kick. Did anyone run into Santos on that? So it looks like it's running into but not roughing the kicker. That would be a five yard penalty and a repeat of fourth down, but not an automatic first down for the Falcons. Basically it gives the field goal unit another chance. From 36 yards, if they so desire. So, and the Falcon field goal unit is heading for the sideline here. I think with fourth and nine, it, they weren't quite comfortable with going for it on fourth down, but for fourth and four, I think with the ball at the 19 yard line at that point, I think it is worth going for it at that point. I mean, I'm the guy who said you should go for it when it was you know, fourth and two at midfield and seven nothing in the first quarter. I'm totally the guy who says you should go for it at fourth and four. And I believe so as well. And the offense is back out on the field. So the Falcons given another chance at fourth down. They will go for it. Try to keep this drive going. So it'll be three receivers for the Falcons. Jesse Brown to the right. Gabriel Mangum and Kevin Quinn to the left. Garvin in the backfield. Ridden is the tight end. And Brown taking the snap out of the shotgun on fourth down. He's going to run for it on the right side. He's going to get the first down. And it'll be out of bounds inside the 10. I think that was a designed quarterback draw. Brown took two steps back, made a cursory look to his left, and then he put his head down and ran for it. That was an excellent play call and very well executed by the Falcons. It's just like when Sagala made that run earlier in the contest. He knew when he got the ball he was going to run, and he knew exactly where he was going to run. And there was nobody there. Excellent blocking by the Falcon offensive line. Now first and goal for Fitchburg. From the nine yard line. Brown will give to Garvin here. Try to push up the middle, try to create a mall. And he's able to get about five yards out of it. Strong blocking by the Falcon O-line. I mean, a play like that is as much about our offensive line is stronger than your defensive line as it is about our running back being really good. The Falcon O-line just swarmed on top of the Dragon defenders and enabled Garvin to pick up about five yards. Second down and goal it will be from just around the five yard line. They move Quinn over to the right side for this play. And Garvin remains in the backfield. Play action, roll to the right, throws it up in the air, but there's nobody there. Need a Canadian field to contain that one. <laughs> Dan Apley, the, the, de the defensive lineman for SUNY Cortland, did a really good job there not biting on the play fake. The way that play was designed, I'm sure the intent was that Brown would have plenty of green grass in front of him and be able to roll out to his right, find a man, get an accurate pass off. But because Apley didn't buy the play fake, he was right on top of the quarterback and was able to force him into making a bad hurry to throw. Now third down inside the five, and it appears we have a timeout. Falcons take a timeout, their first at the half. Two remaining for them with 7.05 to play. 
Took that long to get our first time out of the game. 21-0, Red Dragons. 7.05 to go in the first half. Want to go around the rest of the conference, see who, how everybody else is doing today? Absolutely. All right, so there are six MassCAC games this on this day. This is one of them. And we'll look at the other ones in a moment. But to tell you, last night was the first conference game of the season. And that was Westfield State taking down Nichols by a score 25 to 14. The other games that we have, Endicott at Framingham State. Framingham State's rolling in that one, 27 to 6. Bridgewater State is hosting Buffalo State. And the Bengals of Buffalo State leading 23 to 16. They're in the third quarter of that one as well. Worcester State hosting Salve Regina. Plymouth at Castleton. UMass Dartmouth is at Alfred State. And now the game that you see here, Cortland State and Fitchburg State. We'll talk a little more about that later, as now we've got that third and goal. From the five yard line, Quinn and Jesse Brown to the right. Split backfield yet again, ball on the ground. Brown picking it up, trying to roll to the left side, trying to find some room, try to get around, get to the pylon. He's not gonna get to the pylon, but he was able to make something out of next to nothing and get it to about the three yard line, but it's going to bring up fourth down. I think that was another designed run. Brown was going to be taking off with that from the moment he got the snap. Unfortunately for the Falcons, the snap was a little low and that set the whole timing of the playoff. Ultimately, it was man on man, Brown trying to go for the front left pylon, but Brandon Lewis of the Cortland Red Dragons did a really good job containing his man and forcing the quarterback out of bounds. And now it is fourth and goal at about the three yard line. Now when it's fourth and goal from this close, you might as well go for it. And the Falcons will call their second timeout. All right, and just to finish that scoreboard update to give you more exact scores on what was going on in those games. So Plymouth is up on Castleton 7-0. That's the, that's the MassCAC champion against next week's opponent for Fitchburg State. UMass Dartmouth is up on Alfred State 14-0. And as we said, Cortland up on Fitchburg 21-0 and trying to find out what the score is between Salve and Worcester, but there are no updates from Coughlin Field in Worcester. How dare they? Don't they know we have padding to do? <laughs> got so much, we've got a lot of things to say. So 6.29 to go in the second quarter. Cortland scoring on three consecutive drives making it 21 to nothing, but the Falcons trying to get on the board here against a tough Red Dragon squad. Fourth and about two. So Garvin to the left of Brown. Three receivers to the right for the green and gold. Brown looking to the right, throws into the end zone, intercepted. Picked off by the Red Dragons. And able to bring it up to the 30 yard line and a flag comes in at the very end. Flags down at about the 35 yard line. It's definitely not going to negate the interception. It's really the worst thing that could have happened on that one because you figure you fail on that play, you pin them deep, but they pick it off and are able to bring it about 30, down, 30 yards downfield. I, I think it's possible that the left end zone is actually cursed. Or is it cursed in Fitchburg's favor? or against Fitchburg's favor. That would be bad. That would be very bad. Who hired that witch doctor? I don't know. I think it was Mark DeLuise, the senior linebacker from Wayne, New Jersey. Made the interception there for the Dragons. Let's see what the foul is after the interception was made. It's a block in the back against the Dragons. Also a block in the back against the Falcons. Don't often see that, but uh, those will be offsetting fouls. Block in the back on a, essentially a defense. Hmm. Well, you can't push someone in the back. That's fair. Mm -hmm. And both teams were guilty of it. So it places the ball at the 25 yard line. The 
Fitchburg getting all the way to the three yard line and that was as far as they could get. So the 30 yard line is where they'll spot the ball. And Cortland has it back after nearly conceding. Throw on first down for Nick Anderson and he's taken down immediately. It'll be a loss of a pittance. It is minus a yard officially. Tried the quick pass, didn't work out for them. Now second down. Three receivers to the right for the Red Dragons. Play action, Sagala throws long downfield. And that ball is caught. Pass was right on the money, threading the needle between two Falcon defenders. That's and a, and it is Nick Anderson, the senior from Saratoga Springs. Anderson was able to make the catch in stride, pick up some good yardage after the catch. It's first and 10 Red Dragons at the Falcon 41. They go with four receivers on this one, but they'll give it to Akins, and maybe they should have passed that time. They sniffed out the run, and Akins goes nowhere. Second down. Nolan Priante Baird making the tackle for Fitchburg State. He is a Fitchburg High grad. The only Fitchburg High alumnus on the Falcon roster this year. Second and 10. And Sagala steps back, throws, and nearly a one-hitted catch by Nick Anderson. He would have had to accomplish a lot on that one to pull that one in. They really do like that play action, quick pass to the left side, basically just running a go route up the left sideline. They hit it a moment ago, just missed it now. Pass a little bit behind Anderson. Now quickly, third and 10. On the Fitchburg 41, empty backfield for Sagala this time. He's thinking about running, and that's a big mistake. Wrapped up by David Morales and Lendl Lubin. And it's a sack. Sagala was under pressure, but probably should have rolled out to his left there. He chose to step up into it, try to sneak through the defensive line. Unfortunately for him, the Falcon defenders converged too quickly. Fitchburg State forces a punt. So back on the field is Liam Casey, the freshman from Woodstown, New Jersey. And Quinn back to receive it. He punted at the 45 yard line, put up in the air and taken in at the 10, and Quinn backpedaling falls down right there. The Falcons will have a long distance to go if they want points on this drive. While we have a moment between possessions here, Dan, I want to give special thanks to the volunteer crew of Fitchburg Access Television. First game of the year for us as well. Our director, John Dextre, is Travis Falk, indispensable as always as the lead tech and our audio producer. Uh, Jared Roberts, Dave Oster, Matt Carroll, Jocelyn Diaz making her debut. Charlie Aulis all running camera for us today. And, you know, there's us. We're, we're here too. I mean, we're on the sheet. We have to find Dan Bullock's good. <laughs> I do my best, <laughs> and you do as well. But we do again thank the all-volunteer crew of Fitchburg Access TV, best access TV station in New England, the country. I mean, come at me, bro. We're better. So now first and 10 for the Falcons from their own 11-yard line to run up the middle. Sterling Garvin carrying it, and he's going to get about a couple of yards on that one. So now for the Falcons, it's not quite hurry up offense, but you do have to be mindful of the clock. Just under four minutes to play. You only have one timeout left. Ideally, you're gonna march the length of the field and go in for a touchdown. I mean, that's the plan at least, right? Especially if you can try to close out the half with a score. It would be tremendous courage for the Falcons. And SUNY Cortland will receive the kickoff to begin the second half. Makes things ever more challenging. Brown with the play action, throws to the right side, wanted Kevin Quinn at around the 20 yard line, but the ball lands about three yards out of bounds. Again, we're playing on an American football field. We don't have that with the Canadian field. Then you'd have an extra guy to deal with too. You would. Plus everyone would have to learn what a rouge is. And I know you know what a rouge is. And I think I might know what a rouge is, but most people don't know what a rouge is. It's the type of thing that makes it weird when you tune in and it's 14 to one and it's like, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. 
it gets really out of hand, we'll have to explain to the audience what a rouge is. No. I hope it does not get to that point. Third down, Brown picking up the ball, looking to his right, throws across downfield, trying to find Jesse Brown, but the ball is four yards overthrown. It was a jump ball forward and back there for the Red Dragons was Demonte Woody as well. Just haven't seen the kind of accuracy from Brandon Brown that you'd hope for in a quarterback that throw didn't really get a chance to set his feet. He just kind of, as you said, it was a bit of a jump throw. He kind of leapt and turned without setting his feet. And as a result, the ball sailed, and he was a bit fortunate that it wasn't picked off. It's been challenging to get some of these passes off as well, as Brown has been scrambling a lot. On fourth down, the Falcons have to punt. It looks like a strong one. Penalty flag down at the snap. We'll see how this results. Nonetheless, Lewis is able to get it inside the Falcon 40. There are flags down from each sideline that were thrown at the snap. That's either going to be an illegal formation or Cortland was lined up offside. I think the Red Dragons would be happy with the result of the play if it's against the Falcons. So they're not going to redo fourth down. They'll take the result. Looks like they'll be tacking that on to the end of the play. And that's just what the Dragons needed. Even better field position. We'll get the ball at the 33-yard line. A short field for the Red Dragons to score in three minutes. Think they can do it? We'll find out. I mean, yes, I do. Well, that was rhetorical, wasn't it? Let's see. On first down, Aikens runs left side, gets about a yard or two. Not a whole lot there on that run. Aikens' 12th carry of the day. It's a little over 50 on the day now. I think that gets him to 54. Now takes the swing pass on second down, but ends up running parallel to the lines and never able to turn towards the Cortland end zone. And so it's going to be a loss of a couple. Falcon defense has actually been really strong at the line of scrimmage and with these the runs and the short passes, you mentioned Aikens has about 50 yards on 12 carries. I know he has a long of maybe 12, 15 yards. He really does not, you know, the typical run from him has not been that four, five, six yarder but the threats for SUNY Cortland have been the downfield passing. That's been the challenge for Fitchburg, is just stopping them on the long, deep balls. Thrown to the right side. Pass is incomplete. Looks like he was out of bounds when he made the catch, but there is a flag on the play. And it's going to be a hold. It's a hold against the Red Dragons. So I believe the Falcon defense has forced another three and out. coaches here in the press box are screaming that he caught the ball. I believe the uh, side judge ruled that he did, but he was out of bounds when he did so. And even if that was the end, if that was the case, I mean, after all, they would have accepted the penalty, probably. Mm -hmm. But since they ruled that he did not catch it in bounds, the Falcons take the results of the play, and it'll be fourth and 11. So now fourth down. Looks like the Red Dragons will eschew the 51-yard field goal attempt and instead choose to punt this one, try to pin the Falcons deep with a little less than two minutes to play here in the first half. I can assure you that the field goal kicker who can kick a 51-yard field goal is a luxury at this level. It's, it's a fair point. And because the ball hit the ground before Casey was able to pick it up, he was not eligible to punt it. So the Falcons are actually going to get the ball from where that happened. From is that the ruling? Something I thought the like ruling that. was that he was down when he picked it up. Yeah, that would be what it was, exactly. Because the, basically the, the snap happened, right? And, yep. the, and the ball bounced. And yep. the punter dropped to a knee 
picked it up, but he was on a knee when he made the pickup. I know you understand me. I'm talking to the people at home. That is exactly what I meant, and I'm glad you clarified it's that. It's okay. I'm sorry, Dan. You were saying yup like five times. I knew you knew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I misspoke, and John Googerty is there to back me up. I knew in my head somewhere I was going to mess up a rule at some point this year because I always do. You know 7,000 more rules than I do, so. So the Falcons get a break, first and 10 at their own 47, with a minute 48 to put points on the board. And on first down, a run up the middle. Garvin's found some space. He's going to get a first down on this one. Down at the 41 yard line in Cortland territory. Now the Falcons, they do definitely want to move a little quicker now, play that two minute offense. Trying to get points on the board before halftime. I don't think Cortland was prepared for the run up the gut there. Falcons with two receivers, two to the right, one to the left. Garvin remains in the backfield. As Brandon Brown looks to the sideline for an audible, calls one now. Now the snap, and he hands off back to Garvin. Ultimately ends up being about the same play as last time. But with the different results as Dan Appley is able to take him down at the line. Pittsburgh burns their last time out. Now 108 left. 68 seconds to go in this first half. Cortland 21, Fitchburg nothing. We look at the stats as it's been as they've been compiled thus far. Brett Sagala, 7 for 10 for 149 yards and three touchdown strikes. Brandon Brown, 4 for 14 for 31 yards and a pick. Garvin, the lead running back for the Falcons, 13 for 48 on the ground, a long of 17. And Johnny Aikens, 12 for 54, a long of 15. It's just been those deep balls, those home run passes. Those have been the difference in this contest. And I mean, you take a look at it for Cortland, you've got Alex Wasserman, one catch, 67 yards and a touchdown. Jake Smith, one catch, 40 yards and a touchdown. Even, you know, Jason Carlock, one catch, 14 yards and a touchdown. Those are, the, those are the touchdown catches. Nick Anderson's got two for 29, and Johnny Aikens has two for minus one. The swing passes haven't worked. And so second and 10 for the Falcons from the Cortland 41-yard line. As Brown will take it, take a moment. He's going to run with it. Now to the left sideline, trying to juke out a defender. And he's going to stumble out of bounds just short of the 35-yard line. But it will stop the clock as he goes out of bounds with 60 seconds on the clock. It's good work there by Brown. He didn't have anybody open. The pocket was collapsing, so he was able to gain positive yardage and, more importantly yet, get out of bounds, stop the clock. Falcons, as we've mentioned, have no timeouts left, but now they have one full minute as they face a third down and six. Ball will be at the 37-yard line, a four-yard gain for Brown on third down. And Brown stepping back. Looking to his right this time. He's going to have to run with it again. He nearly finds the hole. But he's taken down just one yard short. And I think he is so far short that they're not even going to measure. So the clock will continue to roll. Falcons facing fourth and one and up against the clock. Try to get this play off to stop the clock and then get into the end zone somehow. And on fourth down, Brown throws left side. That is caught by Jesse Brown. That pass was high, but Jesse Brown can jump. He was able to leap up, make the catch, and get the first down. The Falcons will just clock it. 22.1 seconds left here in the first half. Nice catch for Jesse Brown on fourth down. A great conversion for the Falcons to keep the drive alive. So 22 seconds should theoretically be chan a chance to get off two or maybe three plays, assuming you don't have a man tackled inbounds. At this point, if you're tackled inbounds, that's pretty much the end of the half. That sounds about right to me. We'll see if the Falcons can pull something out, go into the end zone with the score, and go into halftime with the score. Well, that too. So it'll be second down after the, after the spike. Two receivers to the right again. Brown looking to the left, st struggling, stumbling, and taken down. Sacked by Brendan Maloney. 
I think they're going to get Cortland for driving the quarterback into the ground. Could very much be the case, especially basically Bear hugged him and then threw him to the ground. And the first thing I thought was, well, that killed a couple extra seconds. But is it legal is the better question. Well, that's the thing. You know, Cortland defender Maloney had Brown wrapped up. Yeah, they're going to call it unsportsmanlike conduct, basically driving the quarterback into the ground. He had Brown wrapped up. He had the tackle made, and then he left his feet and drove him into the turf. You can't do that anymore. That is going to be half the distance to the goal, and more importantly for Fitchburg State, stop the clock. Now 14 seconds, they've got a chance for one or two, one or two shots at the end zone. So they'll spot the ball at the 15 yard line. The officials still discussing a few matters. Line's been discussing something with Jim McGuire. When they start the play, Tom McKetty will be the man in the backfield for the Falcons. Two receivers to the right, one to the left. There'll be a throw to the right, looking towards the end zone. And that ball is intercepted. Picked off by DeMonte Woody. Trying to find the end zone second time that Brandon Brown's thrown in the end zone and second time it's been caught by a Red Dragon. Falcons had two receivers on the right side. Couldn't really tell if that was a quick slant to the near man or a deep fade to the man on the far side. Kind of split the middle there. And unfortunately for Fitchburg State, it was picked off by SUNY Cortland and they are just gonna take a knee and go into halftime with a 21 point lead. The Red Dragons don't score in the second half. They don't need to score in the second half. They'll have the ball coming into the, going into the second half, so. Or did I say the second quarter? Did I misspeak at any point? I probably did, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, going into halftime, it's going to be Fitchburg State nil, SUNY Cortland 21. So Dan, coming into this one, obviously, New coach, new quarterback, new running backs, new receivers, new everything for Fitchburg State. It was going to be a test, and it has been a test in the first half. SUNY Cortland leading this one by a score of 21-0, and frankly, it hasn't been that close. It has been a challenge for the Falcons, and although we've seen them have a couple of good drives, they've had two chances now in the Cortland red zone, and they come away with two failures, two interceptions, just going for six, and the Falcons come up empty both times. You know. They get one of those catches, they get two of those catches. It's a much different ball game, but right now it's a three score game and it looks like if you're going just by the scoreboard that Cortland's been dominating. That's been true for the most part, but the Falcons, they've been strong, they've been fighting back a little bit, but I guess one could say they have to do a little better than that, but we've still got 30 more minutes of football to play. There was some positive momentum for the Falcons, really on both sides of the ball in that second quarter. You know, the defense forcing a couple of three and outs for SUNY Cortland, the offense putting together a couple of drives. But unfortunately, I mean, you don't want to boil it all down to one player, and it certainly hasn't been that. But it's tough to get past looking at Brandon Brown's stat line. Five completions from 17 attempts for 34 yards two interceptions. That's been the big challenge, I think, for Brown, is just trying to get on the right page with the Falcon receiving core, which as we said is mostly new. Only, only Jesse Brown had actually made a reception for the Falcons of the receiving core, and only Kevin Quinn has joined the list of Falcon receivers who have made catches before. The other, all the other receptions going to Sterling Garvin and Jaquay Salman, running backs coming out of the backfield to make catches downfield. But it's been a big challenge for Brown. It's just trying to get on the same page with the receiving core. All right, so we are going to take a break. Step aside for halftime here at Elliott Field. Folks, if you're in Fitchburg, we absolutely encourage you to come on down. It is a beautiful day. If you're not, you know, stick around. Live coverage continues on FATV.org. You see right there, 18 minutes and change until we are back with the second half of action. It's opening day here, Falcon Football Live on FATV.
Jenry Rosario ends up with the ball around the 30 yard line. It just squirts out of the hands of Demelian. Ball in the end zone. This is picked off. End zone pass is caught. Touchdown, Falcons. Connor for Simons, quarterback. Javon Waite, free safety. Jenner Rosario, outside linebacker. Brandon Brown, I'm a quarterback. Hi, I'm Connor Briggs, offensive line. Jared Citizen, defensive back. Herbert Acosta, senior wide receiver, offensive captain. So Antonelli throws over the middle, and that is caught, touchdown! You get the snap off, Antonelli will throw towards the end zone, and that ball is caught, touchdown! This is Fitchburg State football. Fitchburg State football. And this is Fitchburg State football. And this is Fitchburg State football. This is Fitchburg State football. Costa goes in motion, play action, fake throw to the end zone, wide open and caught. Touchdown. On FATV. On FATV. On FATV. On FATV. On FATV. On FATV. This is Fitchburg football on FATV, baby. Get live. It is indeed Fitchburg State University football, the opening game of the season here at Elliott Field. I'm John Gugardy, joined by Dan Bullock as the Falcons take on the Red Dragons of SUNY Cortland. And let's bring in Amanda Agassi. Amanda is actually with the parent of someone from SUNY Cortland who made the drive from New York. Bye. Billy Piano here. He came all the way down from New York. He's a Cortland dad. Thanks for joining us on Thank FA you, TV. Of Thank course. You. So we just want to talk about you made that troop all the way up here. How was it? Actually, not too bad. Uh, three and a half hour ride. Me and my buddy Eddie took the ride up to go support the Dragons. My son plays on the team, so it wasn't that bad. It's all a good day. Beautiful day out. Beautiful day Beautiful out. Day. Beautiful day. So I'm gonna get run over. Oh no worries, guys. no worries. <laughs> and how many years has your son been on the team? Uh, this is actually his first year. He's a okay. transfer from another school, so it's his third year. He's a junior, but technically he's playing as a sophomore. So this is his first season. He took off a year, was injured, and now he's back. So okay, that's yeah. great. Great yeah, to see him back on yes, the field. I'm yes, sure that must be yeah. the best awesome. thing to see him. Absolutely. So glad that you're able to come out here. Um, any words you'd like to shout out your son right now at all? Uh, Billy Boy, you know, we love you. We're proud of you for making this long trek back. We know you had to work hard to get where you are, and I'm just happy for you to stay safe and go Dragons. Let's go. There you go. Back up to you guys. Thank you so much, Amanda, there. We thank as well Mr. Piano, the father of Billy Piano, the sophomore DB for the Red Dragons. Thanks again for your cooperation there. And Dan, there's a lot to be happy about for the Cortland fans here at Elliott Field and watching at home on FATV.org. Yep, absolutely. And we welcome the Cortland, you know, the SUNY Cortland fans, the Red Dragon faithful tuning in on FATV.org. So happy you could join us for the opener. Week one of Division Three college football season, and it's been a good first half for the Red Dragons, leading 21 to nothing. 185 offensive yards to the Falcons, 110. Three touchdowns all in the first quarter, all by way of throw. Jake Smith, a 40-yard pass. Jason Carlock, a 14-yard pass. And Alex Wasserman, a 67-yard pass, all coming from Brett Sagala, the new quarterback for the Red Dragons, taking over for the graduate Stephen Ferreira. Meanwhile, on the other side for the Falcons, it is a new look up and down the offense. New quarterback, new coach, new running backs, new receivers, or new running backs getting the chance to start. And really, it hasn't quite gelled yet. We'll get more with that later, but we're ready for action here in the third quarter of play. And with the play-by-play -play is Mr. Dan Bolek. Thank you very much, John. Bryce Santos gonna have a second go at kicking off here as the first one, the ball fell off the tee. And a booming kick downfield. Taken in around the 10 yard line by the Red Dragons and brought up to just short of the 35 yard line. Cole Burgess making the run back for Cortland. They'll get their first drive of the second half. They haven't scored, they did not score in the second quarter. And really, Dan, the Red Dragons do have 21 points, and their quarterback, Brett Sagala, has a very impressive line. Seven out of 10, 149 yards, three touchdowns. For the most part, the SUNY offense has moved in big bursts. A 67-yard play, a 40-yard play, a 30-yard play. 
Fitchburg State has been able to contain them outside of those big gainers. And for the most part, not too many huge runs, although there is a fairly huge run there. 13-yard run for Johnny Aikens to open up the second half. Johnny Aikens' long run in the first half was 15. Give him another 13 yards there. It'll bring it up to 67 yards on the day. He'll take it again, try to run to the right, try to spin around there, but Melcher Lynch had his legs wrapped up, and he'll only get about three yards on that one. Other side of the ball for the Falcons, it's been a lot of Sterling Garvin on the ground, 13 carries, 53 yards. Also Brown, the quarterback, six carries for 25. We did mention that Brown was a mobile quarterback, and he's been moving around, going for a long pass again, and they find Jake Smith yet again. And Smith this time will be wrapped up short of the end zone. But there you go, another big pass, another big gain for the Red Dragons, and that has been their bread and butter today. And four or five times the Red Dragons have thrown long down the left sideline. I think they really believe they have a mismatch there with DeMonte Hart, the left side cornerback for the Falcons. And Hart, just a freshman, his first game with the green and gold as Aikens gets about a yard or so. They'll mark it at the 10 yard line. Now if you're just joining us after taking the halftime break, SUNY Portland has already marched downfield. They have the ball at about the Falcon 10 yard line. Now second down and eight for them. And Sagala. Will look to take it himself, running to the left side, trying to find the space, going to the pylon, dives in there, touchdown, Red Dragons! But there's a flag down. It would be the fourth quarterback, the fourth touchdown of the day for the Red Dragon quarterback, first on the ground. However, given the position of that flag, I would be inclined to think this one's coming back. The fans arguing over whether or not it is holding. Officials are indicating that it's a penalty against the Falcons. Is. Face mask against the Falcons. So they're going to assess that, I believe, on the kickoff. The touchdown is good. So after a scoreless second period of play, SUNY Cortland takes the opening kickoff for the second half, and they march downfield for their fourth touchdown of the game. Now fortunate for them that they were able to go down to that hot end for them. All four of their touchdowns on the end to the left. Extra point is up. Extra point is good. 28-0 Red Dragons. So just like that, SUNY Portland expands their lead to four scores. SUNY Cortland scoring on the opening drive. And how about I talk about their little rivalry game that they have? I mean, Fitchburg will have their rivalry game in two weeks when they play Worcester State in, as part of the Sterling Cup. Okay. But for SUNY Cortland, their rivalry game is the Cortica Jug, and this year will be the 60th time they'll be taking on the Ithaca College Bombers. For the Cortica Jug. That will be the case. And SUNY Cortland had actually won it seven years in a row, but they lost the Cortica Jug last year, 48 to 20, as Ithaca was able to come away with the victory in that one. And they will be it for the final week of this season. So it's interesting for SUNY Cortland, they play two non-conference games to open up the schedule, then they have their seven game slate in the Empire Eight, and then they finish off against Ithaca in a non-conference game. Did you run that on purpose or was it just happenstance? It was happenstance. Okay. It was very good. Well, thank you for that. And the Empire Eight has eight teams for football. SUNY Cortland not normally a member of the Empire Eight. They're normally a member of the SUNYAC. But the Empire Eight doesn't have the teams. There are not enough SUNYAC teams to have a football conference, so they have fun in the Empire Eight. All the teams that play football are in New York State. It works out. So it's been short kickoffs all day. And this one will be taken in on the far sideline by the Falcons, pushed out of bounds around the 10-yard line. I mean, short kickoffs 
Noah Weinman, I think you said his name was. Yes, it is. Yeah, because suddenly his name escaped me, but. All of these kickoffs have been taken in very close to the sideline for Fitchburg State. Obviously, you can't just let the ball bounce around wherever it's going to go over there because that is a live ball. So you probably pick it up and gain possession. But still, if that ball is going to go out of bounds, you just let it, maybe? Very well could be the case, although on that particular kickoff, the ball had gone out of bounds. It would have been at the 20-yard line. It would have actually been terrible. You could even call for the fair catch. You have to remember that is an option now. You can call for a fair catch inside the 25 and they'll put the ball at the 25. They'll call it a touchback. That is a new rule they put in this year. You have, to, you have to remember that's an option that is available to you. I did not know that was a rule. Brand new for this year. There's a three yard gain on first down for the Falcons on the ground. It's part of trying to eliminate sort of the injuries that occur on kickoffs. We've already had some very bad injuries in the first week of the season or so at the Division I level. Just trying to do what they can to make the game safer. On second down, Brown will hand it off to Garvin. He finds a hole in Sterling Garvin at the 30, taken down now at the 35-yard line. Big run for the Falcon senior running back. Fantastic blocking by the Falcon O-line and a great run by Garvin. Really the biggest play of the day for the Fitchburg State offense. They were pinned back fairly deep in their own territory. Now they pick up more than 20 yards and they have it first and 10 at their own 36. Gives the Falcons some hope on this drive. Another first and 10. As they line up with three receivers. And this time it'll be Jaquay Solomon trying to get around all the Red Dragons, but in the end, Four of them teaming up to take down Solomon for a gain of about three feet. Second and nine it'll be. Falcons going exclusively on the ground. I'm curious to see how strong Cortland's pass defense is compared to what we'll see out of Castleton next week. I'm curious to see how the difference will be. Maybe it's just been a bad matchup for Brown that he's not been able to find that many completions as Solomon will get about two yards on this one. They're going to actually mark forward progress at the 40-yard line. They'll make it third and six, so a three-yard gain for the junior. And this has been the problem more so in the first quarter it was, but even in the second quarter for Fitchburg State. You run it on first down, you run it on second down. If you don't get a big gain on either of those, you find yourself in third and seven, third and eight. Here it's a third and six situation. And now SUNY Cortland knows you almost have to throw the ball. So that puts even more pressure and it makes it even harder for your freshman quarterback, Brendan Brown. And the Falcons were one for 10 on third down in the first half. And this short throw is intercepted. Didn't get a lot on that one. And Denari Beard, the sophomore linebacker for Willingboro, New Jersey, gets the interception, the third interception for the Red Dragons today. Almost looked like that ball was tipped as he released it, maybe. It was not, it was not an attractive ball. It was not a good spiral. It looked like it was wobbling more than the quarterback might have intended. And as you said, Dan, it's the third interception of the day for SUNY Portland. And I believe you're right, John, because that pass, I mean, I can't imagine it was thrown intentionally in that spot only for the fact that Beard was really the only person who had a legitimate shot at hauling that ball in. So now SUNY Cortland, having just put their fourth touchdown on the board, they have excellent field position once again, and they're going for the home run. They're going for Smith. They've got Smith. Touchdown, Red Dragons. Once again, it's Jake Smith. But yet again, there's a flag. And this one is coming back. It's a hold on the Red Dragons. They went right for the six again, but this time the penalty is against Cortland. And this time, my touchdown Red Dragons is meaningless. And that really is a break for the Falcons. I mean, obviously the quarterback had a little more time because of the hold, but all along the near sideline, the hold didn't matter. Smith was just wide open, had his man beat. 
beautifully thrown ball, but it comes back because of the penalty. It seems like how many times has this happened today? That's been the Falcons' kryptonite. Their pass defense has not been able to keep up with the Cortland receivers on those deep balls. So now SUNY Cortland is backed up first and 20. This time they'll just go with a run on the ground. Aikens spinning around to his left. Taken down by Richard Austin. Melcher Lynch also there. As Aikens will get it to the 49 yard line. Of course with the holding, second and very long. Be 17 to go, a three yard gain on first down. Sagala looking back, looking for a long throw over the middle again, and this one is incomplete. Overthrown for Alex Wasserman. Javon White with the coverage for the Falcons. And as this game goes on, Dan, SUNY Cortland is just throwing the ball downfield with impunity. Their quarterback has all the time in the world to throw. Their receivers, more often than not, have at least one step on their defender. If that connection is made, that's going to be six points. And on second and 17, why not go for a long pass? You need a lot of yardage anyway to get a first. They'll probably try it again. Sagala will roll to his right. Ducks out of a tackle, throws long downfield, and that is caught! And that is going to be a touchdown! Nick Anderson, 34-0 Red Dragons. And this time, Dan, we just mentioned how the quarterback had all the time in the world to throw. This time he's under pressure. This time he has to roll to his right. He has to bail out of the pocket. He's able to set his feet and throw. There are three Falcons there, and they all misjudge the ball. They all go for the tip, the deflection, the interception. The pass goes over all of them, and it's a touchdown. The pass always seems to go two yards, two, three yards farther than the defense is set up. Four for four for extra points today. Try to make it five for five. They will. 35 nothing. Red Dragons, 9.30 to go in the third quarter. Maybe the left end zone isn't cursed. Maybe it just has like a, a dragon magnet. Is that possible? Could be. I mean, that's only going to come up like every time you play Sunni Only that. There are no other dragon-based mascots exactly. in the mascot. Are there any wyverns? Don't think so. No, any worms? Like with a line? No. Okay, we're good. Yep. It's good to know. As long as it doesn't attract Spartans, because that's next week's opponent. No. So to go over the mascots, for those inclined, it will be the Spartans, the Lancers, the Bears, the Buccaneers, the Rams, Owls. Colonials, Panthers, and the Corsairs. Those are the mascots the Falcons are facing this year. Okay, so so a lot of uh, animals and semen. Okay. That would, be, that would appear to be the case. I don't want to try Cortlands. I know most of them, but I don't remember all of them. I mean, we're playing Cortland over the Dragons. Yep. But I mean all their opponents. Swainman uh, on the kickoff taken in at the 23-yard line by the Falcons and pushed out of bounds there. Around the 30-yard line. Tom McKetty with the return for the green and gold. At this point, the Falcons are just in search of points. Yeah, it's... I mean, to a certain extent, it's been that way since the first quarter, and if you're a very big pessimist, to a certain extent, it's been that way since opening kickoff. This is less about let's put five touchdowns on the board and try to make a heroic comeback and be on Sports Center or something. This is about let's get some positive momentum going. Let's get some confidence in our new quarterback, in our new offensive scheme. Let's get something positive on the board for Fitchburg State. After all, this is probably going to be one of the most, maybe even the most challenging opponent that the Falcons face this year. As Sterling Garvin gets to the 36 yard line, a seven yard gain on first down. To, to a certain extent, Dan, I would expect that SUNY Cortland will play a little more conservatively on defense, especially on first down. They're not going to stack the box, so maybe Fitchburg State will be able to get something going on the ground. They may also be willing to go to the second string, third string on their depth chart, maybe, maybe around the fourth quarter or so. But they're going to be a little more 
affable to playing players that aren't necessarily as high on the death chart as Brown rolls out in play action. He's going to have to take it himself. But he's going to be wrapped up at the 31-yard line. He just never found an opportunity to get a pass off. So the Falcons added a little bit of a wrinkle there. They did the play action. I think that was a designed run. There, was, there weren't any passing options, and Brown, as soon as he made the play action fake, he tucked that ball like a runner. He was not looking to throw it. He was looking exclusively on the ground. And because of that, SUNY Cortland knew they didn't have to defend the pass. They could just swarm the quarterback, and they were able to do so. We'll bring up third down from the 32-yard line. They go with the run this time, trying to get a first down that way. It's Chris Tomichetti, but he gets to the 34, and that's five yards short. Not going to get the first down that way. And Bryce Santos is back on the field. And we mentioned on the last possession, Dan, third and long, it's a really obvious passing situation. So it makes it that much harder for your quarterback. The Falcons try to take a bit of the pressure off Brown, maybe keep SUNY Cortland guessing. And now we got some whistles and flags to kill this play. An illegal substitution indicated against the Falcons. So they'll be backed up another five yards. Would have been enough for a first if it was against Cortland, but against Fitchburg, it's minus five and just makes it a little more difficult. So now for the Falcons, in addition to the execution mistakes and the failure to really achieve anything on the offensive side of the ball, you start seeing the mental mistakes pile up. Yep. And now it's going to be a forced fake as Santos never comfortable enough to get the punt off. And it's going to be Cortland Ball deep in Fitchburg territory. Everything going the Red Dragons way here in this third quarter of play. The second quarter had been a little more balanced, and neither team putting points on the board. Fitchburg State moving the ball downfield. This third quarter thus far, uh -uh, none of that. SUNY Cortland has dominated every aspect of the game for the last seven minutes and 53 seconds. As we were saying before, we knew it was going to be a challenge starting the season with Cortland. And it has been a challenge in 12 tenths. Here's a throw to the left side, and that was nearly a touchdown catch. But it was going to have to be a one-handed catch made by Jason Carlock, who's looking for a second of the day. SUNY Cortland once again going to the left side. This time it was Malik Crawford on defense for the Falcons, and Crawford did a good job staying with his receiver and preventing the touchdown catch. Only the fifth incompletion for Sagala today. Already with four touchdown passes and a throw. Akins this time taking it to the left side. Gets a couple. Javon White with the play for the Falcons brings up third down. A question for SUNY Cortland. Do they have someone, is Mongelli comfortable enough to kick a field goal? And Sagala will scramble up the middle. Falcons are going to stop him at the 15-yard line. One of the players lost his helmet, so he'll come off the field for a play. Set up fourth down and five. It'll be about, looks like they are bringing on the field goal unit, about a 32-yard attempt. And I will tell you, Dan, during warm-ups earlier today, they were kicking down the other end of the field, but I saw the Red Dragon kicker, Nick Mangelli, making these kicks from 40, maybe even 45 yards. So he definitely has the leg for 32. In That's his, not a concern. In his career, Mangelli is one for four, and as long as 44 yards. That one is up. That one is good. And so there you go. The shortest field goal of his career made. 32 yards for Nick Mongelli, 38 nothing Red Dragons. Mongelli, five extra points, and he can add a field goal here. If you have Nick Mongelli as your kicker in a D3 Upstate New York Massachusetts Fantasy Football League, what are you doing in that Fantasy Football League? Get a life, man. But hey, your kicker's good. And Mongelli, as we said, one for four. William Holsher was their kicker last year in those regards, and he was 9 of 12, but he was their extra point guy. He only missed one from 41 attempts. But this year they go to Mongelli. He 
He's the junior kicker and punter, although he's only kicked today, from Marlboro, New York, which is one state off from being your alma mater. Sure. Also, I didn't actually graduate, so, you know, but yeah. Fair enough. Close enough. Go Panthers. And we'll be seeing the Marlboro Panthers, I believe, on television in a few weeks. I believe so. That seems like a natural segue. It's a shame I don't have my schedule in front of me. Well, I'll give you till the end of this play, and then you'll be able to promote that. <laughs> tomato. Fine. That ball is knocked out of bounds at the 39-yard line by Marquise Colton. And I have met your silly ultimatum because I do have the upcoming FATV football schedule. Next Saturday, a 2 p.m. kickoff here at Elliott Field as the Falcons take on Castleton. And then the Saturday following that, September the 15th, we are back here at Elliott Field, Fitchburg State versus Worcester State, that being another 2 o'clock kickoff. We don't have our first Fitchburg high game of the night until Friday the 21st of September, a 7 o'clock kickoff against Neshoba Regional. And yes, October the 5th, Fitchburg High versus Marlboro at Crocker Field. I will wear orange for that game. Look forward to that. First and 10, more of the Falcons from their own 39. And Jaquay Solomon trying to find yardage, finds about three feet and nothing more. Down at the 40 yard line. He was looking for yardage, he found a yardage. Couldn't have said it better myself. Look at the running numbers thus far. Sterling Garvin, 17 for 79. Jaquay Solomon, I believe that was just his fourth carry of the day. Hasn't been able to find too much real estate, though. Second down. And Solomon, again, getting the handoff. He's not going to get back to the line of scrimmage this time. They'll give forward progress to the 38-yard line. That's going to be a loss of two yards. Kyle Richard, the senior captain from Lakeview, New York, made the initial hit there for the Red Dragons. Now third down and 11 for the struggling Falcon offense. Search of a first down as we go to third down. Offense must get the ball to the 49 for a first. Solomon still in the backfield. Brown going to look to pass this time. He's going to break away from a tackle. Appley in pursuit. And Brown able to get a gain, get it to the 41-yard line. But that's eight yards short of where they need to be. Looked like he was trying to find Gabriel Mangrum on the right sideline here. Wasn't able to get open, however. Brown ultimately tucked the ball and ran, picked up a few yards, but it will set up the, I'm gonna say, 27th Falcon punt of the day. It feels like it, doesn't it? If we had an exact count, this is going to be number seven. Okay, so I was close. The eighth attempt after what happened on the last one. This time, a well-struck ball taken at the 22-yard line, tumbling down just short of the 35-yard line was, I believe, Brandon Lewis yet again. Tackle made that time by Kyrie Watford, starting defensive lineman for the Falcons and also the long snapper. He is set to be the long snapper for the Falcons, and, well, he has been doing the long snapping. What I find interesting is on the 2 deep, who the reserve long snapper is. It's also the reserve quarterback, Connor Fitzsimons. Very strange. Well, you do need a, you need a good arm. You definitely need a good arm to be a long snapper. I will say this for Bryce Santos. In addition to being a very good punter so far, excellent head of hair. Absolutely. On first down, throw to the right side. And brought up for some yards is Cortland Joshua Cordero, sophomore running back from Monroe, New York. I believe that's the first time we've called Cordero's name today. It definitely is. And when you're up by 38 points, Maybe it's about time to start giving some other players on the squad some goes. Especially when you have 115 names on your roster. Second down. Go to the right side, Tripodi. Stumbled on his first running attempt of the day. Doesn't stumble on this one. And he keeps going till he's forced out of bounds inside the Falcon 45. Zach Tripodi, the junior from New Fairfield, Connecticut. Graduate of New Fairfield High School, picks up a first down there. 
Charles bought it right at the 45 yard line. The nose touching the line. Sagawa still in the game for the Red Dragons. Another handoff to Tripodi. And he's able to scramble for 11. Good second effort as well by Tripodi. He was initially hit and looked like he was going to be down after a gain of about seven, but he was able to stay on his feet, actually used his hand to claw forward, picked up another three, four yards, and a first down. And now Tripodi a third time, runs to the right side, and they're going to wrap him up and tackle him out of bounds inside the Falcon 30. Red Dragons feel like they have a mismatch there with Tripodi running to the right side. That time they hurried up to the line, didn't give the Falcons ch a chance to adjust or make substitutions. They're right back at the line of scrimmage again. Second down, this time a pass, a swing pass to Tripodi. He's able to shake out of a couple of tackles and he won't be taken down until he's inside the 20. There's an old story about Pedro Martinez. The Pedro's changeup was so good, he could go to home plate, tell the batter he was throwing a changeup, walk back to the mound, throw a changeup, and still get him to swing and miss. I think SUNY Cortland is saying, we're going to give the ball to Tripodi. You know, this time a play action throw over the middle pass interference. One of the more obvious cases you'll see. That time they wanted to find Jackson Hines. Freshman tight end. The linebacker bit very hard on the play action fake and then had to just shove the tight end down to avoid conceding the touchdown. They didn't call the pass interference, but they called. It's an illegal substitution indicated against the Falcons. Sure, shoving a guy down after he beats you on a pass route, that's an illegal substitution. You illegally substitution him from a standing position to a sitting position. It's only five yards gain, this time a run to the left side. I believe that's, uh, that's Wasserman. That's not Wasserman, the ball carrier. No, that's uh, Roy Harvey. With a wonderful set of hair, senior running back from Jamaica, New York. He'll have some goes now. Give Tripodi a rest. Second down it'll be. This time pass throw to the middle and uh, nobody there. I would assume that there was miscommunication. Maybe quarterback thought the tight end was running, running one route and the tight end thought he was running another because there was absolutely nobody in the vicinity of that football. I think he threw it to the ghost haunting that sideline. That is the haunted Enzo. That is. Maybe he can see the ghost. Maybe he can. Apparently the ghost is wearing white. Well, that makes sense, it's a ghost. That would make perfect sense. This one run up the middle. It's a few more yards. It's gonna be enough for a first. Down at the three yard line. Cortland close to six more. This time, it's Tripodi trying to go to the end zone. It's very close. I think and they've given him the score based on the eruption from the near sideline. Indeed they have. Touchdown, Red Dragons. 54.6 to go. And now 44 to nothing. I think at the end of this episode of Scooby-Doo, we're going to pull the mask off the ghost, and it's going to be Old Man McNeil from Portland all along. Dan McNeil's Red Dragons are dominating the Falcons today. A brilliant offensive performance from the Red Dragons. Very difficult to stop. Extra point is up. That one hit the uh, upright. So there's Mangelli's first miss. So again, the score remains. Sweeney Cortland 44, Fitchburg State nil. It's not a score you see very often. 44 to nothing in a football game. Unless, of course, you're playing Canadian football, there were a couple of rouges involved. But we, we promise not to tell people what a rouge is, right? We promise not to tell people what a rouge is. But, okay. But we do have a, but we do have a trivia question to ask. Okay. I think, I mean, 44 nothing sounds bad. It sounds bad, it's, it's pretty bad. 
it's not good. But here's the trivia question for you folks at home. Okay. So week one of 2017, St. John's of Minnesota taking on St. Scholastica. The final score in that contest, 98 to nothing. That's not good. St. John's of Minnesota, the Johnnies, taking down the Saints of St. Scholastica. Now the question that I have for you folks at home mm -hmm. is in their nine remaining games. Do I get to play? Maybe you get to play. I, maybe I get to play. So okay. In their nine remaining games, how many did St. Scholastica win? The answer coming in the fourth quarter. Okay. So stay tuned for that. On the kickoff, taken in at the 25-yard line by the Falcons. It is Lovett cutting laterally across the field, turning to the 40-yard line where it will be taken down there. Good return for Martin Lovett, third. And a well-designed kickoff return there for the Falcons. Obviously, SUNY Cortland, they really don't have a kicker with a super strong leg, so they do the little pooch kick up along the sideline, get everyone running in one direction. Why not, if you can, take the ball the other way, try to go around everybody. Got pretty good field position for them. So we'll start at the 40 on first down. A little pitch to Sterling Garvin. Gets airborne for a moment there. But ends up being down at the 45. He gets half the distance to the marker. We've seen the Falcons fake that play a couple times and then roll Brandon Brown out to the right side. I believe that was the first time they actually went ahead and just executed the pitch left. They were able to pick up a good five yards with it. Not a bad play. Is it six? I bet it's six. Six wins. Seems like a lot for a team that lost by 98 points. That's true. Know, we'll find out eventually. We will find out later on. Some of the people have who are watching on FATV.org might already be looking up the answer. If themselves. you know the answer, hey, how about this? Here's a social media plug for you. If you know the answer to Dan's trivia question, which again is how many wins did St. Scholastica get in their remaining nine games after suffering a 98-0 defeat? If you know the answer to that question, go to FATV FATV's Facebook page and post it. Let us know. You could receive the eternal gratitude of knowing you were right. <laughs> and maybe a business card or something if you come in and ask Ann for I don't know. I can't promise prizes. I'm not authorized to promise prizes, Dan. I mean, you didn't even know there was going to be a trivia question I until today. If I had known, I would have gone through the proper steps, filed the paperwork, and gotten authorization to offer prizes. Well, we'll go around the MassCAC now. Okay. Yep. So Framingham State beat Endicott 34-13. Bridgewater State, after losing by a point to Buffalo State last year, get revenge, and they win by a point, 30-29. Okay. UMass Dartmouth up on Alfred State, 35 to nothing, and Plymouth State up on Castleton, 21 nothing. Those scores early in the third quarter, I don't know if they've been updated in a while. So as we head into the fourth quarter of action here, Falcons face a second down and five. Handoff goes to Sterling Garland, straight up the middle. He's across the midfield stripe, and that will be enough to stop the clock, move the chains, and pick up a Falcon first down. Garvin has had a pretty solid day on the ground for the Falcons. They'll get him to 85 yards on 18 carries. So first and 10, ball at the 48-yard line in Cortland territory. Falcons still with Brandon Brown, the quarterback. He's got Sterling Garvin and Chris Tamachetti in the backfield with him. Brown from the shotgun, looks left, throws left, passes long, a bit underthrown. Leaping catch is made by Jesse Brown. There's a flag down as well. Brown is down at about the four-yard line after a gain of 42 yards. Flag is down in about the area of the catch. I'm inclined to think it's pass interference of some variety. I think it's against Cortland because it looked like the defensive back had his back to the ball and that is indeed the case. They will decline the pass interference, take the results of the play, and have first and goal at the four. So the Falcons with their biggest offensive play of the day, the deep pass along the left side, as I said, it was a bit underthrown, but a really good mid-air adjustment by Jesse Brown, despite the pass interference. He made the catch, picked up yardage after the catch, and now the Falcons have first and goal at the four. 
Garland in the backfield for the Falcons, joined by Kenny Richards. He's the fullback to the left side. Handoff goes to Sterling Garvin, looking for yardage straight up the middle. Now just push the pile. I mean, the entire pile's in the end zone. The ball's got to be there somewhere. Touchdown, Falcons! Sterling Garvin with the four-yard run, his first touchdown of the season, and the Falcons are on the board in 2018. The last game of 2017, the Falcons were shut out. It will not be a bookend beginning to the season as the Falcons are able to put points on the board against the Red Dragons. But Sterling Garvin, the lead running back, getting the four-yard touchdown after it turned into one big rugby mall. They push it forward and across the line. Now Bryce Santos will attempt the extra point. Good snap, good hold, kick is up and good. So it is 44 to seven with 13.42 left to play here in the fourth quarter of action. So you're saying there's a chance? There is a chance as I make air quotes that nobody can see. <laughs> As I've said before, I think the more important thing is going to be seeing where Pittsburgh stacks up after next week's game against Castleton. After all, Plymouth seems to be having no trouble handling the Spartans as they'll be coming down from Rutland, Vermont to come to Fitchburg in a week's time. And we mentioned earlier, Plymouth is handily beating Castleton. What's the score in that Plymouth and Castleton game? The last update that I got, it is now 31 to nothing Panthers with 11.20 to go in the fourth quarter. So we have more points than they have. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, we do. That's something. Also, I just called the Falcons we, which I suppose I shouldn't do, but eh. Well, we are both Fitchburg State alumni. This is true. And we're on Fitchburg Access Television. It's like we have the right to use the Royal We, we just choose not to. Sure. Except when we forget. Right. Absolutely. So Santos will kick it away for the Falcons. It's a low line drive kick, bounces at the 15 and picked up at about the 12. Taken out 25-30, across the 35 and brought down at about the 37 yard line is Cole Burgess. It's a pretty good return for him. The freshman from Greenwich, New York. Welcome him to Division Three football with today's game. Looking over Cortland's roster, many, 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 many players from the state of New York, as you would expect, as Cortland is based out of New York State. Only a handful of players really based out of different states, and even then it's just neighboring states like Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. The Falcons, for instance, have eight players from the state of Florida. And I believe every New England state except perhaps Vermont is represented as well. That Back to live action here, handoff goes to the left side. Flag comes in behind the play. Ball carrier on that one was Roy Harvey for SUNY Cortland. And Cortland also going to the bench for quarterback as well as Tommy Hewer, a freshman from Oceanside, New York, comes into the contest. So welcome him to Division Three football as well. As a penalty against Cortland, will back them up some yards. So a hold against SUNY Cortland. That'll make it first down and 20. Not terribly surprising, SUNY Cortland with the 37-point lead, choosing to rest the quarterback, rest the main running back, get some guys some reps in the first game of the season. Dan, is it me or does it look like it's going to rain? I had a 10% chance of rain on the forecast coming into today. I'll take the over on that. I also originally had mostly cloudy before the weather looked like it was going to be partly cloudy, and it's been partly cloudy for most of the day. Just a little more clouds coming into the sky as the day goes on. Harvey's carry on first down, gets about three yards. Call it second down and 17. Second down pass, long to the right side, pass is high, incomplete. A hard hit, and apparently a clean one delivered. Fans on the SUNY Cortland side are not happy with the non-call. The Falcon defense is happy with the hit. Watching that play was for Cole Burgess, and he was hit as the ball came to him. I think it was clean. 
just well timed is what it was. I believe that was Nolan Creont Baird delivering the hit. And it'll bring up third down and 17 now for the Red Dragons. Hewer back to pass again, throws long to the right, this time wide open. Making the catch in open space is Trevor Ash. And he burned his defender to a cinder, got wide open there. Junior wide receiver from Auburn, New York. Found all the space, all the time that he needed to haul that catch in. Give the Red Dragons a first down. First down now for the Red Dragons at the Falcon 40. Play action fake, pump fake, and throw to the left is complete. Dancing out of tackles, got a first down and more. Finally brought down at about the 25 yard line. That's number 85 for SUNY Cortland, Chris Montero with the catch and run. Some names we haven't seen, but effective offense nonetheless for the State University of New York at Cortland. First and 10 now, Red Dragons at the Falcon 25. Quick pass to the left side is complete. Dancing out of a tackle once again, looking for yardage across the 15, close to the 10 yard line. I believe that's Dakeem Davis's first catch. Senior from Clarkston, Georgia. Well there we found a player who's not from the immediate Northeast. Although he did attend Hutch Technical High School in New York. So not immediately from the Northeast, we'll say. And the Falcon defense will take a timeout, try to catch their breath. As the Red Dragons are breathing down their neck once again. That's a good way to get burned. So 11-12 to go in the fourth quarter, and I think now is a good time to get to the answer to that trivia question. Okay, so once again, St. John's of Minnesota and St. Scholastica met in the first week of 2017. St. John's won by a score of 98 to nothing. The question is, how many games did St. Scholastica win in the 2017 season? Yeah, so they had nine remaining games. And I said to you earlier about your guess of six. Seemed like a lot for a... It did. Is it nine? It could be nine. They were just undefeated for the rest of the way. Would well, sound crazy enough, but all's told, the answer was seven. They seven. won seven games that year. So it goes to show that even in a game with massive disparity, it doesn't mean that's the end of the season and it's going to be a terrible run for you. St. Scholastica was able to bounce back. They won seven games in a row after that loss. Okay. So, you know, watch out Castleton and the six teams that the Falcons play after that. There is absolutely a chance at all of them. And that's where in the, in the next seven games, five of them will be at home for the Falcons. So that's where it will have them all right here on FATV. First down and 10 from the Falcon 11. Handoff goes to the left side for SUNY Cortland. That's Roy Harvey once again. And Harvey's brought down after a short game. Give him about three yards. It'll be second down and seven. going slowly but surely is the Red Dragon offense. SUNY Cortland more than content to run out as much clock as they can. Second down and six, throwing now for the end zone, wide open. Touchdown SUNY Cortland and that's Trevor Ash once again. So they change quarterbacks, they change running backs, they don't change putting points on the board. Tommy Hewer to Trevor Ash. SUNY Cortland wants to be the very best, like no one ever was. It is 50 to seven. And for the first time today, we have a score in that end zone. It's true. So on the last extra point, Mangello hit the upright. Let's see if he can do a little better this time. Good snap, good hold, kick is up and good. So with uh, AM 1030 WBZ left in this one, it is 51 to seven, SUNY Cortland. Dan, are there any other 50 point scores on the board right now? 50 point scores, well, let's see. UMass Dartmouth has 42 on Alfred State. 
who has seven. And I should point out, Alfred State is not the same as Alfred University. Oh, of course not. Who Cortland will be playing in t three weeks' time. How oh. many schools named after Batman's butler are there? Well, there's just the two Alfred ones, both in Alfred, New York, a town of 10,000, yet they have room for two universities at the Division Three level. Okay. And Fitchburg is familiar with Alfred as they played them a few years ago in the White Law Bowl, a postseason game that was held in 2015 at Central Connecticut State University. That game was won by the Alfred Saxons over the Fitchburg State Falcons by a score of 11 to 10. I remember it so fondly because me and the public address announcer for Fitchburg State, the longtime PA announcer, Dr. Robert Hines, we called that game together, and what a fun day it was. Speaking of Dr. Robert Hines, he has passed me a note, and I'm, just, I'm going to read it verbatim. And I realize it's every bit as bad as my bud, but it's funnier because it's his bud. Touchdowns. Just watch Ash catch him. Uh. <laughs> I love this press box so much. So very much. <laughs> but good times here at Fitchburg State, even if we're down by 44 points. And I just <laughs> and I just used the Royal Wii. You did. Mm -hmm. You did. You really did. Kickoff actually does go out of bounds this time, so it will be an illegal kickoff against the Red Dragons. Fitchburg State will have pretty good field position set up at their own 35-yard line as they look to build positive momentum heading to, toward the end of this one. And again, our next telecast will be next Saturday, uh, September the 8th, against Castleton, a 2 p.m. kickoff here on FATV. First down handoff goes straight up the middle by Sterling Garvin. Not much there, maybe two yards. At this point, I'm watching to see if Sterling Garvin's going to be able to get to 100 yards on the day. He has put in Yeoman's work as the main ball carrier for the Falcons. He inherited the number one from Javon Brown Simpson, who was the lead running back the last two years, who has graduated. Garvin now up to 20 carries on the day. Looks like 94 yards in total. Second down and seven for the Falcons. Pitch to the right side. This is Jaquay Solomon. Picks up a couple. Not much there, however. It'll be, call it third down and five. So Jaquay Solomon, his sixth carry of the day, but he has been struggling a little bit. Hasn't been able to find the hole. I think he's up to 10 yards. Not what you want. So third down and five now for the Falcons. They'll go trips receivers to the near side. Solomon remains in the backfield with Brandon Brown, the quarterback. Brown will throw to the left. Pass is caught. It's his favorite target, Jesse Brown. Brandon to Jesse Brown, and Brown hook up for a first down there. Needed five, he got five. Stop the clock, move the chains. First down, Fitchburg State. Seventh completion of the day for Brandon Brown and the fourth to Jesse. Jesse Brown, the junior from Yonkers, New York. Same alma mater, same hometown as Malik Crawford. They come into Fitchburg State together. First down pitch goes to the right side. Jaquay Solomon, the ball carrier, spins out of the initial hit, gets across midfield into Red Dragon territory. All in all, it's a gain of about nine yards. That's the breakthrough type of run that Jaquay Solomon's been looking for. Nine run, nine yards, nearly doubled his yard total on the day. All he needed was to lose a shoe. You lose the shoe, you lose a little bit of weight, it makes you more efficient. You go faster. That's how it works, right? I hope so, and if that is indeed how he got the nine yards, then he needs a new pair of shoes. Second down and one for the Falcons. Chris Tamaketti now in the backfield for Fitchburg State. Brown back to pass, under pressure, escapes. He's gonna pick up the first down and more across the 40, 35, 30. Brandon Brown's into the open field, and he's brought down at the 25-yard line. That's the most explosive running we've seen out of the Falcons freshman QB. 
Brandon Brown may very well have just doubled his running total on the day. He had eight for 22 going into that run. Picked up about uh, 22 there. It's good for another Falcon first down. Fitchburg State knocking on the door again. I believe this is the third time they've gotten the ball deep into the territory down this left side of the field. The previous two times, however, wound up with interceptions in the end zone. First and 10 Falcons at the 25 yard line. Tamaketti in the backfield. Brown on the option pitch, gives it to Tamaketti. Tamaketti lowers his shoulder, delivers a wallop. Picks up about three, maybe four yards. And once again, Dan, we see the Falcons mixing in a bit of that option. Trying to do whatever they can. I think they've been detecting that they could be more successful on the ground rather than going through the air. Brown now just seven for 20 on the day. In fact, he's only attempted three passes in this second half, but he's completed two of them. But nonetheless, the Falcons moving a little more towards the running game later into this contest. Second down and six now. Chris Tamaketti remains in the backfield. He'll take the pitch to the right side. A whole bunch of dragons converge on him at once. I mean, when four red dragons are that mad at you, you just you crumple up your character sheet and you roll up a new character. You are done. Can I make like three more d, &D jokes or is five my limit? I think you've got a couple more going here. Okay. The differential is, I mean, the gap is 44 points. It's a fair point. Tamaketti brought down after a short loss. He'll head to the sideline for a breather. Jaquay Solomon checks back into the backfield. The third down and seven now for Fitchburg State. Brown takes the shotgun snap, looking left. Now he's going to keep it. Gets a block, breaks a tackle. He's got a first down, lunging forward and driven out of bounds at about the 13-yard line. So Brandon Brown picks up a first down, and we have a flag coming in after the play. Looks like there's one red dragon in among the entire Falcon offensive huddle. And then some words were exchanged, and a flag was thrown, and now the referee has his notebook out. Offsetting penalties. Words were exchanged, and the referee felt the words coming out of both the players' mouths were unacceptable for broadcast or anything else. And in addition to that, Stefan Armand has been ejected from the game. He was the Falcon who was called for unsportsmanlike conduct, and he has been asked to, re to leave the contest. A rather shocking turn of events in that regard. But with the offsetting penalties, the Falcons don't lose any yardage. It's first and 10 for them at the 14-yard line. Tamaketti remains in the backfield alongside Brown. And now we have delay of game. Because let's just call every penalty imaginable. Uh, we haven't seen too many men on the field yet. Don't think we've seen an ineligible receiver. We have not seen that. We had a legal substitution. We have that. And we've had taunting. We've had pass interference. Now we have to play this game. So first and 15 for Fitchburg State. Play action fake. Brown rolls to his left. Brown is in a lot of trouble. Brown is sent. About four red dragons converging on him. You get that as a random encounter, and then you're just you reaching look, for the you reset look button. look at your DM, and you're like, really, four? Four, Roy, you're gonna throw four at me? Fine. How many D20 do I have to throw to get out of this one? <laughs> you throw them at the DM is what you do. Uh, Vincenzo Pagliaroli made the official sack there for SUNY Portland, a fact that I mentioned almost entirely so that I can say Vincenzo Pagliaroli. Third down, excuse me, second down and 21 now for the Falcons. They need to get to the four yard line. Brown's in trouble, he'll keep it himself. Across the 20, 15, gets a block. Brandon Brown is into the end zone. Touchdown, Falcons! 
So from nothing, there is six points. Well, we did say Brandon Brown is a mobile quarterback, and he shows off the mobility there. That time, the, the Dungeon Master threw a few fewer Red Dragons. <laughs> And whatever Brandon Brown needed to roll to get out of that one, he rolled the right number. Got himself some bonuses and other D Dungeon & Dragons terms. I just don't remember offhand because I've never played the game. At the end of the day, though, it's six more points for the green and gold. Second touchdown of the day for the Falcons. Extra point attempt is up and good. So it is now 51-14 with 3.40 to play. And really, Dan, that was a very good play by Brown to Brown. He was under pressure, stepped up, saw open field in front of him, and then it's just creating when you've got the ball. You know, you're in the open field, he made a couple good moves, ducked out of a couple tackles, and then he was just faster than the last guy. Absolutely. He knows he's got the moves, the wheels that he needs to make. 12 for 70 on the day now. 12 carries, 70 yards, and a touchdown now. He's got the long run of the day for both teams. A 24-yard touchdown run. 24 yards and the touchdown. Those may have been separate plays. No, those were the same play. They were play. the same play. But regardless, he's had a couple of nice runs. He's shown himself to be a valuable asset on the ground. The potential is there. There's, you know, there's not nothing. There's something to build on which is what you wanted out of this fourth quarter of what has been a, uh, a rather one-sided football game. Absolutely. So 3.40 to go in the fourth quarter. And we also want to remind the viewers, if you missed the answer to the trivia question from earlier today. The Saint hotly anticipated answer. Yeah. St. John's in Minnesota over St. Scholastica, 98-0 on week one of the 2017 season. How many games did St. Scholastica win? They won seven of their nine remaining games. So even with the huge blowout, it's not the end of the world. There's still oh, nine more games to be played. Santos's kick is brought back to about the 34-yard line. That's uh, it's actually Zach Tripodi making the return for SUNY Cortland. Tripodi had an, a couple of nice drives. He's got a touchdown run on the day. Let's see what Cortland does. Three and a half to go in this contest. Up by a boatload. 51-14 the score, three and a half minutes to play here in the fourth quarter of action. SUNY Cortland's backup quarterback, Tommy Hewer, takes the snap, quick pass to the left side, is complete, breaking tackles and diving forward for a first down. I to believe that's Tayshawn Dodd's first catch of the day. Junior running back from Wapigers Falls, New York, the same hometown as former Fitchburg State Hockey standout, Ryan Connolly. 5'6", 195. Getting a nice run there for the Red Dragons. And that is enough to pick up a first down. So SUNY Cortland's second stringer is getting to run not quite a full two-minute drill, but at least a bit of an aggressive offense here. High snap on first down. Handoff goes to the fullback. It's, I believe Tyrell Plaza. Yes, it is Tyrell Plaza, the ball carrier. It'll be the seventh time that Cortland has deliberately given the ball to a player today to run with it. I have to say that because Liam Casey's uh, picking up the ball on a punt attempt while he had his knee down counts as a negative run of 13 yards. That's not good. It wasn't good. Second down and seven now for the Red Dragons. Handoff goes straight up the middle, breaking through tacklers into the open field. Tayshawn Dodd, one man to beat, can't do it. He's brought down at the 10-yard line. Tayshawn Dodd with a big game. So you go deep, 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 deep into the Red Dragons depth chart. You find players like Tayshawn Dodd, but Tayshawn Dodd can still make some things happen. It's now first and goal at the nine as SUNY Cortland looks to extend their lead. Penalty against the Red Dragons will march them back five yards.
So kick down to 103 seconds now. Does Cortland really want any more points? Yes. Why not? First and goal, handoff goes to Tayshawn Dodd. Pretty much the same play call. He's still on his feet, actually. Finally, they're gonna blow him dead. Thought he had been stopped a few moments before. It's pretty much the same play call as the big gainer. This time, nothing doing. Maybe a slight gain. But to answer your question, Dan, yes. Yes, they do want points, especially this set of uh, Red Dragons. These are not the guys who put all 51 of those points on the board. You know, Tayshawn Dodd does not have any touchdowns today, for instance. I'm sure he wants to put points on the board. I wouldn't blame him one bit. Second and goal from the eight now for SUNY Cortland. Less than a minute to play in this one. Hewer back to pass, throws to the left side. Pass is caught, but incomplete. Actually lost the handle there. Trying to find Kim Davis there. Almost had it down. If he had made the catch, not quite sure if he would have been in there for the touchdown. I think his feet were around the goal line, but he was falling forward away from it. Doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Third and goal from the eight, 46.6 seconds left to go in this one. Tayshawn Dodd, the ball carrier, takes it straight up the middle. He's brought down just shy of the goal line. And the Red Dragons technically do not have to run another play. We'll see if they choose to. Second stringers want to get one more point. Or I think their coaches are calling them off. Yeah, we're going to see some handshakes exchanged here. And SUNY Cortland is going to be content to go home with a 51-14 victory over the Falcons of Fitchburg State University. We'll get to our credits and thank our crew in just a moment. But first, Dan, obviously, this isn't what you wanted for your first game with a new coach and a new quarterback and a new outlook at Fitchburg State. But it's not all negative. Indeed, it is not. The Falcons were able to find a couple of points late in the contest, but nonetheless losing by 37 points. Bit of a challenge, you know, in the first matchup between Fitchburg and Cortland in really any sport. Of course, it happened right after the retirement of Sue Lauder after 22 years at the helm of Fitchburg State University Athletics, who is a member of Cortland's Hall of Fame. Amazing that we never really got any matchups done there before her retirement. Of course, we wish her well in retirement as Cortland comes to Fitchburg and comes away with quite a big victory to start their 2018 campaign. And again, folks, we do want to mention our next telecast will be next Saturday at 2 o'clock as the Falcons take on Castleton. And that, again, is a 2 o'clock kickoff right here on FATV. And, Dan, what do you think Fitchburg State needs to do in order to improve on this performance going into next week's game against Castleton? Well, I think at the very least, they've taken some lessons from facing Cortland. After all, they're one of the, they're probably going to be the most challenging team that the Falcons will play this year, maybe outside of Framingham. We'll see after next week's result between Cortland and Framingham, how tough the Red Dragons truly were. But nonetheless, ah, I've lost my train of thought, but the end of Dang it, Dr. Hines. Yep. Walked by us, said hi, and now we lost what we were saying. Yep. But as I've been saying all through the telecast, I'm more concerned with how the Falcons will do next week against Castleton. Castleton struggled against Plymouth. Plymouth's a very good team. Fitchburg struggled against Cortland. Cortland is a very good team. How next week's game is going to go against Castleton, I think, is going to determine how this season is going to go. And Cortland's next game against Framingham will help set up more context for us and what we should expect out of the opponents in the weeks to come. Absolutely. We want to thank the entire volunteer crew of Fitchburg Access Television. You saw their names there. I'll just read them off again real quickly. Our director, John Dextres, Travis Falk, the chief engineer for us, Jared Roberts, Dave Oster, Matt Carroll, Jocelyn Diaz, Charlie Aulis running cameras for us. Dan Bolak did a great job as always. I was also present. We will see you next week again, a two o'clock kickoff against Castleton. Until then, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time right here on FATV.